you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the 16th part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Jen staggered back and wiped the blood from her chin. Well, this could be going better. At least Doomsday was having almost as much trouble as she was. Luther's weapon had done the job, and if the monster was healing, it was at a snail's pace. Still, that hadn't stopped him from pummeling Jen into the ground a few times. Her right arm was so shattered that she couldn't move it, and one of her eyes wasn't opening anymore. This is almost fun, Doomsday said as he limped towards her. I just need Superman to take your place, and I might actually be happy. Jen fired a burst of heat vision from her working eye that Doomsday didn't completely dodge, and a chunk of his shoulder was burned off. He didn't feel the pain, but his broken leg made him stumble, and Jen used the opportunity to swing her fist into his skull. Jen felt a bit of triumph, which was interrupted when Doomsday drove his own fist into her ribs. There was a sickening crack as they inflicted fractures on each other. Why are you Jen coughed and spat out blood? Why are you so chatty? I was trapped in the Phantom Zone for years, with nothing to do but think about what I would say to Superman when I killed him. Doomsday growled. This is the next best thing. Jen inhaled, winced as the movement ground her broken ribs together, and blew out a stream of cold air that froze Doomsday's arm solid. She then kicked out and shattered the arm into a thousand pieces. Still having fun, Jen asked. Doomsday lunged, and his spiked knuckles struck Jen across the face. She fell to her knees, and blood poured from the two gashes that joined the other injuries. Plenty, Doomsday sneered, and grabbed Jen by the hair. Just as he prepared to lift her up and slam her down, Jen's working arm began to vibrate. It moved so fast that it almost vanished from view and then she plunged that hand deep into Doomsday's face. Half of the monster's head abruptly exploded, and he let her go. I really need to thank Barry for showing me that trick, Jen muttered, then gasped as Doomsday kicked her across the empty space. Why won't you just stop? Doomsday was missing half of his mouth, so he could only gurgle, but Jen could see the hatred and malice in his remaining eye. She knew he wouldn't stop until one of them was dead, and considering who else she had to fight, there was no reason she should hold back. Jen threw away what restraints she had left, the mental blocks she'd spent her whole life building up, and charged. She ducked under Doomsday's fist and put everything she had into her next punch. Reality shook as the strength of an unleashed Kryptonian connected with something created to withstand that kind of punishment. This time, the immovable object couldn't stand against the unstoppable force. Doomsday's entire upper body exploded from the impact, and his legs flopped over. Jen waited for a moment, just in case Doomsday somehow got back up. But when the fragments of the body stayed where they were, she let herself fall to her knees. Holy crap, she whispered. I am never fighting anything like that again. Uncle Clark can have those to himself. Without a yellow sun to boost her healing, Jen barely had the strength to get back up. Gotta find the others. Can't leave Izuku with just Luther and Crazy Gwen. One leg suddenly gave out, and she collapsed. Oh, okay, maybe I'll take a minute. Frightwig wailed as the remnants of her hair fell, but her scream was cut short when Julie knocked her out with a swift kick to the head. Not bad for my first haircut, she said. If you're done patting yourself on the back, I could use a little help here. Kevin shouted, then grunted when Thumbskull clocked him across the jaw. Sorry, I woe. Julie tried to avoid a stream of acid, but was just a little too slow. Acid spit laughed as the armor on Julie's shoulder began to melt away, and she screamed. Hurts, doesn't it? Acid spit laughed again. What was that about us being footnotes? Julie glared at the circus freak, with a thought, the melting part of her armor detached itself from the rest of her body before it spread too far, and the exposed shoulder was quickly covered in fresh armor. She then raised her arm, which unfolded into a particularly large cannon. You were saying... If Acid Spit was about to comment, he was cut off when a bolt of green energy caught him in the chest. There was a sickening crack as several ribs broke, and the smell of burnt skin filled the air. Julie barely mustered the drive to check if he was still alive, and hardly felt any relief that he was. Still need my help, Kevin. 
By way of answer, Kevin merely dropped the unconscious thumb skull at her feet. Now, where's the ringleader of this crappy circus? Right behind you, kiddo. Zimbozo cackled as he stepped out of a cloud of confetti and slammed an oversized mallet into Kevin's head. Son of a, Kevin stumbled, but his shell held up against the hit. One of his arms turned into a blade, and he swung for Zimbozo's legs, but the clown vanished into more confetti. I really hate that trick. Julie staggered when Zimbozo reappeared and struck her across the face with his stretching arms. Back to back. Don't let him sneak up on us. Kevin nodded and put his back against Julie's. You know, Ben used to be scared of this guy. I know, Julie said tersely, but he told me how to beat him. Feel like sharing with the rest of the class. He likes to scare people, and he feeds off of it. But Ben got more angry than scared, so he had nothing to feed on. Julie smirked and raised her voice. And he's also a coward. You really can't blame me, Zimbozo called out from the darkness. There are things in the universe far scarier than me. Just look at old Vilgax, he doesn't even have to set foot in a universe to destroy it. Do you know how scary it is to know that you could get snuffed out without even knowing who killed you? That's called dying in an accident, Julie retorted. It happens all the time, we don't need Vilgax for that. Accidents aren't actively hoping for the end of life as we know it, Simbozo shot back. Then why the heck are you helping him? Kevin asked. Simbozo cackled. Because watching him kill everyone is funny. By then, Julie had figured out where he was and bombarded the shadows with rockets. Simbozo rolled out of the explosions and tossed what looked like bowling pins at them. Julie remembered what Ben had once told her, and a segmented shield unfolded from her arm. She grunted from the blast of the exploding pins, but wasn't hurt. Kevin darted from around her and punched Zimbozo right in the squeaky nose. How do you like it, clown? Zimbozo's arms stretched out and wrapped around Kevin like an anaconda. About as much as you'll like this trick, Sonny. Kevin was slammed into the ground, but he freed himself by creating spikes all over his body. Zimbozo pulled back his arms which dripped blood that wasn't the right color for a human and snarled. Now that wasn't funny. Well, this sure is. Julie shouted and punched Zimbozo in the face with all the strength her armor could muster. Several bloody teeth flew through the air and Zimbozo fell to his knees. Motif. Ooh lilish. Julie wrapped one hand around Zimbozo's throat. Okay, that's kind of funny. More teeth were sent flying as she punched him in the face over and over until he was knocked out. Nice quip, Kevin said tiredly. Ben would have liked that one. You think? Julie grinned, though the smile didn't reach her eyes. I'll have to tell him about it when we bring him back. There was a bright flash of light, and both of them shielded their eyes. What the heck was that? Kevin asked. Not sure, but it came from where Izuku and the others were headed. Come on. Luther coughed, and scowled when more blood leaked from his mouth. How pathetic. Well, at least I've given a good account of myself. He stood on a literal pile of Vilgax's drones. Most were the common variety that he'd seen before. But there were three-eyed hounds and ape-like goliaths covered in spikes. Luther had done well at first, but the small amount of damage each monster had inflicted started to add up. By now, his armor could no longer fly. His weapons were out of power, and a lucky shot had punched clean through his chest and out his back. Luther didn't need his armor's failing internal diagnostics to know that he was dying. But at least the breaches had closed, and there were no more drones to fight. Luther glanced at the beam of lighter he had stepped into. As far as he could tell, nothing had changed, and there was nothing left for him to do here. He considered trying to rest, but he knew that if he stopped, he wouldn't get back up again. He heard a roar, and saw a bloody human gausser go flying back. Ah, I see the children still need my help. Luther staggered in the direction of the very one-sided fight and saw Vilgax standing over Midoriya. The boy had turned into swamp fire to heal from his injuries, but Luther knew that it would only prolong his suffering. Weak, Vilgax sneered. The multiverse chose its champions poorly. Perhaps, Luther admitted, getting their attention. It's as you said before, our little group consists of traumatized children and me. Hardly the sort to save the multiverse. Then you know that you had no chance of succeeding, Vilgax said. Luther laughed, even as more blood poured from his mouth. Oh, we had the greatest chance of all. The person best suited to realizing just how limited your vaunted power really is, and how to put all the pieces together so that you would lose. And who would that be? Luther grinned and held his arms out. Why, me, of course. What makes you so special? Vilgax asked. I'm the most ruthless, most pragmatic, and most intelligent man alive, Luther said. On top of that, I've hurt Ben Tennyson even worse than you did. I orchestrated events so that his son died. I once rewrote reality so that he and his beloved wife killed each other. I left him so broken that the only reason he didn't kill himself is because all his memories of those events were erased. 
You hurt him, yes, but he healed on his own. I beat him. Against me, Vilgax you never stood a chance. Vilgax was still for a long moment. Then, with a snarl of rage, he punched his arm straight through Luther's chest. Black flame engulfed him, erasing him from existence. But as he died, he did so with a victorious smirk. No. Vilgax heard four voices cry out at once, and then he was hit from all sides. Jen only had one working arm, but she punched Vilgax with all the strength she had left. Julie's armor unfolded and transformed into a massive cannon that she controlled with one arm. The blast was enough to make Vilgax take one step back. The smoke of the explosion obscured Kevin as he charged in. His arm a sword and stabbed Vilgax in the leg. Midoriya couldn't be hidden as he went way big and brought his foot down on Vilgax with all the force he could muster. Before any of them could wonder how much damage they'd done, they heard a shattering sound. Gwen's hair looked more like pink fire as she blasted her way out of her prison. Mana formed in her hands, and she flew straight at Vilgax. This is for Ben, you son of a bitch. Gwen had long since passed the point of restraint, the force of an exploding star, concentrated into a single point, hit Vilgax square in the chest. The shockwave was so great that everyone else was sent flying back. Kevin shakily rose to his feet. No way he just walks that off, right? Gwen was about to answer when Vilgax grabbed her by the throat without a single scratch on him. That was almost impressive, he said, and tossed Gwen aside like a rag, then punched way big in the leg. The pain of his leg shattering was so great that Midoriya collapsed and could barely focus enough to turn back into swamp fire. I have had enough, Vilgax said. You have failed to provide even a little entertainment. I thought you might pose a challenge at this final stage but you are barely worth my attention. I will kill you now, and then I will kill that girl. No one will stop me from ridding this multiverse of all life that might stand against me. No Omnitrix, no Azmuth, and no Ben Tennyson. Professor Paradox raised an eyebrow. I was wondering when you were going to show up. Oh, please, you always know the when. The professor shrugged and held out a bag full of clothes. I suppose I do, and I know why you're here. Not to worry, I came prepared. These clothes are. You could change them, of course, but I imagine that people will expect this look. Paradox smirked. And there's nothing wrong with a trademark, is there? I was going to say that I love it, and I'm honored. I promise to do you proud. I know you will. Paradox looked at his watch. Don't you have something you should be doing? You should know that I've already done it. Ah, uh, of course. Good luck, and please apologize to Ben on my behalf. Which one? All of them. My dear, thankfully, time is on your side. There was a flash of light, and four arms grunted as Vilgax punched him. There was pain, yes, but to his surprise, it hurt far less than it should have. What? Vilgax looked down at his hands. What? Four arms opened his eyes. They were no longer at the beginning of time. In fact, he wasn't sure where they were, other than in the middle of a desert. It seemed to be late in the afternoon, and there was nothing around for miles. Jen blinked. What the heck are we doing in Arizona? That would be my doing, a familiar voice said both what Vilgax is feeling and where we are now. I thought it would be a good idea to finish this battle without collateral damage. Perhaps out of shock, Midoriya turned back to normal as he stared at the impossible. She was taller, almost as tall as Jen, and her voice was a little deeper, but Midoriya recognized Iri's eyes, hair, and horn. She was no longer a child, but a woman in her twenties. Her outfit was almost identical to Professor Paradox's, but with a knee-length black skirt and leggings. Her smirk was so self-satisfied that Midoriya wondered if she had been imitating Lex Luthor in the mirror. Hello, everyone, you can call me Paradox. No professorship. I'm sorry to say, ironically, I haven't had time to get my degree. What did you do? Vilgax demanded. Oh, that. Paradox waved her hand dismissively. I just reconnected you to time itself and then removed your timeline from the temporal stream. It was quite a challenge. Even for me, I had to do it in stages or risk unraveling the history of everyone you've ever interacted with. That's why it took so long, by your understanding of time. As for why you're weak or well, when your timeline gets unspun, you tend to start dying. That's what you're doing now, Vilgax, you're dying, and your power is bleeding out. What's worse is that it's vanishing faster every time you do well, anything. Wait, Gwen shouted. What about all the damage he's done? Paradox smiled. All the worlds his armies destroyed have been brought back. The multiverse is no longer falling apart. The crisis is over. Kevin was quiet for a moment, and then pointed at Vilgax. Ha, huh. in your face, you stupid squid. Vilgax's response was to punch Kevin in the chest and send him flying 50 feet back. If that is true, I still have power to spare. I will take what time I have left and spend it killing you all. Perhaps I will destroy this pathetic planet before I die. I can tell that I have strength enough for that. You do, Paradox agreed. 
and I will be honest, the heroes here aren't strong enough to stop you. That's why we're here, another familiar voice said. Thanks for telling us where to go, Paradox. Ben Tennyson looked her up and down. Yeah, the new model's gonna take some getting used to. Jen rubbed her working eye. Dad, hey, honey. Ben's smile faded when he saw who his daughter was standing with. Okay, not what I was expecting. He walked over to Gwen. Hey, dweeb. Gwen blinked. Hey, dork, nice beard. Thanks, I like it. Tennyson, Vilgax growled, even as he started retreating. How are you here to stand against me? This is not your battle to wage. Ben laughed, but there was no humor in his voice and a bitter anger in his eyes. Hey, the non-interference rules only applied while the crisis was on. Now that it's over, we decided to join in on the party. Midoriya slowly walked over. Who's we? Ben looked him over and Midoriya knew he was a sorry sight. His costume was dirty and torn and his visor was cracked. Kid, we is everyone. Behind him, green and purple portals opened up. And everyone wants a piece of old squid head. Before anyone could ask, people began coming through the portals, some walked, some flew, but Midoriya recognized many, and Jen recognized them all. It's about time you guys showed up, she said with a laugh, one tinged with relief when she saw John Constantine, who gave her a look. What's wrong, love? You look like you've seen a ghost. Beside Constantine, a beautiful woman with white hair and a stage magician's outfit elbowed him. She's probably just surprised you're sober, John. But I'm not, Constantine protested. I guess he doesn't remember, Kevin said as he limped over to them. None of them do, Paradox said with a sad smile. Your friend Mirio remembers a little of it, but only until the part when you recruited him. I imagine he's quite confused right now, Izuku. You'll have to explain things when you get back. All right, Midoriya found it hard to see through his cracked visor, so he took it off. Did the entire Justice League come to help? And the Titans, Ken added as he and Supergirl flew over to them. Their eyes went wide when they saw the group. Jen, you look like crap. Jen scoffed, then winced and held her good arm to her broken ribs. Please, I look better on my worst day than you do on your best. Still doesn't mean you're not in rough shape, hang on. Ken snapped his fingers, and in a flash of green light, everyone's injuries were healed. There you go don't everyone go thanking me at once. Not that this isn't fascinating, Verdona said as she also joined them. But it appears that Vilgax is getting away. Midoriya took in Vilgax's stance and his narrowed eyes. No, he's just giving himself space. Vilgax made a tearing motion and multiple breaches appeared. It seems that I can still summon my army. Paradox shrugged. I wasn't able to erase your entire force, though I did make sure to destroy all the factories you had hidden away. Whatever you have now is all you're going to get. If it is enough to destroy you, then I don't need more. Vilgex pointed at the small army of heroes. Kill them all. Midoriya tensed, but then felt a hand on his shoulder. Ben looked down at him with a grin. This is your party, kid. It's your call. For the first time since this insane mission began, Midoriya grinned with genuine excitement, and he held up the Omnitrix. Let's take this guy down. You heard him. Jen grew to her full size. Let's go. The first wave of monsters barely made it halfway across the battlefield. Heat vision from Superman, Supergirl, Ultiman and Superboy vaporized most, and those that survived that couldn't withstand the magics of John Constantine, Zatanna, Dr. Fate, and Raven. The second half of the second wave used the corpses of the first half as shields, and they slammed into the hero's line. After that, it became a confused free-for-all. Deku could barely keep track of who he was fighting alongside at any given moment. At one point, he was Diamond Head, back to back with Wonder Woman. At another, he was Shock Squatch, frying a drone that was about to hit Green Arrow from behind. Ultra Girl stomped on one drone after another, while Bonfire flew at her side. Her fire turned anything her girlfriend missed into charred statues of ash. The shell Kevin had gained from Luther had broken, so he made do with layers of stone. He turned his hands into hammers and bashed the skulls in of any monster he could find. Above him, Gwen and Verdona fired concentrated beams of mana that sliced drones into pieces. Julie fought alongside Ultiman and Supergirl. Rather than try to destroy the drones herself, she just tossed them into the air, making them easy targets for Kryptonian heat vision. Despite the confused melee, Paradox was oddly serene as she moved through the battlefield. Her horn blazed with yellow energy, and any enemy that got within a few feet of her simply vanished, rewound out of existence. This is getting us nowhere, Ben complained. He had turned into Heat Blast and landed next to Deku. Vilgex might not have unlimited numbers, but he's still got a lot of these guys. Iri, I mean, Paradox said that he was dying, Deku said, then turned into Big Chill to let a drone pass harmlessly through him. The more he uses his energy, the faster it will go. Then we need to keep him distracted, Ben decided. Deku's eyes went wide. 
Oh, oh, I can do that. What? Ben blinked when Deku turned into Jetray and then flew off. Kid, wait. Jetray flew over the army of drones and found his target. Vilgax was directing what looked like a never-ending column of his monsters through the breaches. This is where it ends, Jetray shouted. I'm not going to let you hurt another world, Vilgax. I don't even know who you are, Vilgax growled. I told you. Jetray fired several neuroshock beams at Vilgax, then turned into heat blast. My name is Midoriya Izuku, and I'm going to stop you. At first, Ben was worried about Deku, and had been on his way to help, but then he stopped and stared when the kid started transforming. It wasn't the variety of aliens that shocked him, but the speed with which he transformed. It was happening so fast that it looked more like a single beam of green light that was running rings around Vilgax, shooting everything from fire and water to crystals and radiation. He can do that, he asked, then turned to Supergirl. Can I do that? Supergirl pinched the bridge of her nose. Oh, great, I have to deal with you trying. Thanks for the migraine, Ben. Ben winked. Anytime, Kara. Then the playfulness left him. Come on, let's help Izuku out before he makes a mistake and Vilgax hurts him. Supergirl raised an eyebrow when she saw Vilgax get tossed backwards. Somehow, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Vilgax roared as he lashed out, but like all his latest attacks, he missed. It wasn't just that this child, this Midoriya, was using a technique that he had never seen any Ben Tennyson use before. He was also becoming weaker with every second, his strength and speed were dropping, and he felt sluggish, like he was swimming through tar. And while he was getting weaker, his opponent was getting stronger. Perhaps it wasn't that his power was increasing, but more that he was attacking with less restraint. Fire became an inferno, ice became a blizzard, and electricity became a thunderstorm. Those attacks still didn't hurt very much, but they didn't wound his body as much as they wounded his pride. This boy, one he had never laid eyes on before today, had ruined his chance to rid the multiverse of every Ben Tennyson. This, this cannot be happening. Vilgex thundered. I cannot lose to a child. How about five? Ultra Girl asked as she plummeted from the sky to punch Vilgax in the face. He staggered back, and with the constant flashes of green light in his eyes, he didn't see Kevin until a hammer made of stone crashed into the back of his knee. This time, he fell and was immediately bombarded by missiles from Julie. He hurled a wave of black fire to drive back his attackers, but the flame was far weaker than it had been earlier. That was why it was blocked so easily by a wall of pink mana. Izuku, Wen shouted as she scooped Vilgax up with more mana, serves up. The beam of light followed Vilgax as he was hurled into the sky, until it resolved into way big. Vilgax had just enough time to be furious and was then slammed back down considerably faster than he went up. Instead of hitting the ground, Vilgax collided with Ultra Girl's outstretched fist. He was no longer alive in the traditional sense, but Vilgax felt something that was no longer flesh and bone break nonetheless, and it hurt. Hey, kids, mind if I get a few shots in? Vilgax felt his not blood run cold when Ben Tennyson appeared. Sure thing, dad. Ultra Girl called out, and between her and Deku, they tossed him in the direction of the one person he didn't want to be near. Ben turned into ultimate human Gaussor and grinned. Thanks, guys. Hey, Vilji, been a while, huh? Vilgax managed to bring his arms up to block, but Ben's punch was still enough to bowl him over. He rolled with the hit and landed on his feet, just in time to snatch Gwen out of the air and use her as a makeshift club against Kevin. Gwen was freed a moment later when... After a flash of green light, a diamond spear pierced his wrist. Rather than make a clever quip, Deku, as Diamond Head, just shouted in anger as he wrapped his arms around one of Vilgax's legs. Again, Vilgax felt pain as crystal spikes impaled that leg to the ground. Deku jumped back, just so that Julie, Gwen and Ultra Girl could hit him with beams of energy from three angles. Hold him still, then shouted, and then looked up. We could use a little help, Diana. Wonder Woman, flying above them, tossed aside the drone she'd been beating to a pulp, and threw her glowing lasso around Vilgax. There you go, Ben. Thanks. Ben's arms turned into cannons, while Gwen and Verdona used cords of mana to further secure Vilgax. Now, hit him. Ben bombarded Vilgax for almost a minute straight. Ultra Girl, Julie, Gwen and Verdona added their own considerable firepower. When the smoke cleared, Vilgax had huge cracks and craters in his armor, and his face was flickering even more wildly. There was a double flash of light, as Deku turned into Ultimate Wrath. His last ultimate was even more muscular than Wrath, with tan fur and a shaggy mane, and his fangs were more like a saber-toothed tiger. His clothes consisted of armored pants, with a hole that allowed for a tail that ended in a double-headed axe. Instead of a single claw on the back of each hand, Ultimate Wrath had three, and they were even longer and sharper. 
ultimate wrath roared so loudly that those without superhuman durability could feel it in their bones. He and Kevin charged in close, the latter smashed both hammer arms into Vilgax's elbow, shattering it into pieces. Ultimate wrath drove his fist into Vilgax's chest so hard that his claws actually punched out his back. Paradox nodded to herself. And now it ends. Vilgax staggered back, and his armor started to crumble like dry dirt. He sank to one knee, and though he couldn't raise his arms, he continued to glare at Ben. I will never stop hating you, Tennyson. You will never be free of what I have done to you, and even if I failed to destroy you, I know that I go having hurt you like few others ever could. Ben turned human again and crossed his arms. You did hurt me, Vilgax, and for that, I'll hate you forever. But I moved on I have my family and friends, and I will always be around to stop people like you. So you can hate me all you want, because if I'm being honest, I've outgrown you. Vilgax sneered, even as he started to dissolve, and glanced at Deku. Perhaps you were a worthy opponent. Deku wasn't normally the type to glare at someone, but he gave it his best shot. With his eyes, it was actually quite impressive. You're the last person I want praise from, he snarled. Go to hell, and this time, stay there. The battlefield fell silent as Vilgax died. The few remaining drones were quickly wiped out by the Justice League and the Titans. Is it over? Julie asked. Yes, Paradox said quietly. It finally is. Midoriya stumbled as he finally allowed the last few days of exhaustion and stress to hit him all at once, and from the way the rest of his team reacted. They were in the same boat. Several heroes dashed over to catch them before they fell. Ben grabbed Midoriya, Supergirl caught Jen, and Verdona used her mana to catch Gwen. Julie and Kevin. Great work, guys, Ben said, and grinned. I have no idea what's going on, but I'm guessing you guys saved the world. Jen rolled her eyes. Try the entire multiverse, Dad. She paused, then gestured to Gwen, Kevin, and Julie. I don't think introductions are necessary. Ben's smile vanished, and after he helped Midoriya sit down, he walked over to people he hadn't seen in decades. So hi, Kevin made a face. Really, Tennyson? That's the best you can do. What do you want from me? Ben asked, exasperated. This is just as weird for me. As much as I find your banter adorable. Ben, Verdona said as she floated over to Gwen. There is something I need to handle. Gwen started to jerk back, but Verdona placed her hand on her cheek. There was a flash of pink light, and then Gwen was back to her human form, without a single crack in her skin. Verdona smiled, but it was sad. If you are anything like the Gwen I knew, I thought you'd prefer this form. Yeah, um thanks. Gwen's eyes shone with unshed tears, and she grabbed Verdona in a hug. Sorry, I just really need this right now. Of course, dear. Verdona nodded at Paradox. She should look her best before going home. To everyone's surprise, Paradox flinched. Ah, uh, yes I'm afraid that is going to be impossible. Wait, why? Midoriya asked. We won, right. We brought back all the universes Vilgax destroyed. Well Paradox sighed. If you recall, I said that any universes destroyed by Vilgax's armies were restored. Those destroyed by Vilgax directly are gone. Gwen staggered back as if struck, and Julie fell to her knees, tears already pouring down her face. Kevin's expression was thunderous as he grabbed Paradox by the tie. Explain right now, he demanded. Paradox the other one he said that stopping Vilgax would save the multiverse. And he didn't necessarily lie, but he didn't tell the whole truth. Paradox gently worked her tie free of Kevin's grip. Vilgax had become the avatar of non-existence itself. When he destroyed something, it was removed from reality, not even the reversal of time could bring them back. Ben closed his eyes, it looked like he was trying not to vomit. How many worlds? Too many, Paradox said quietly. The multiverse was reborn, and it is smaller because of Vilgax. I'm so sorry. Gwen put her hand in Kevin's. What happens to us now? Our home, our families, they're all gone. We don't have anywhere to go. Ben locked eyes with his wife, and then his children. When they nodded, he walked over to Gwen and Kevin. They can stay with us. We can help you three find a home on this earth, if you want. Verdona frowned. Ben, are you sure? Ben sighed, and sat down next to Julie. I know more than a little of what you're going through. I've had 30 years to work through it, and if you'll let me, I'll help you. Julie wiped her eyes for a moment. I think, I think we could use a place to stay for the night. After that maybe we can talk. Take however long you need. Ben hesitated, and then gently put his arm around her shoulders. But we should get out of this desert. As much as he hated to admit it, Midoriya couldn't help but feel some relief that his own world had been restored. All he wanted to do was go home and sleep for a week, and unlike his friends, he had a home to go back to. Until he was sure his friends were in good hands, he'd stick around a little longer. The exhausted teenagers were brought to the watchtower for medical evaluations and a chance to rest from their ordeal. 
In particular, Gwen and Julie underwent multiple checkups the former was checked by Verdona, while the latter was scanned by Cyborg. Verdona wanted to make sure that Gwen wasn't about to revert back to being a full anodyte again, and Cyborg was curious about how her ship had bonded to her. That left Midoriya alone with Kevin and Jen, and all three of them were lost in thought. We're probably gonna take Ben's offer, Kevin said abruptly. Jen looked at him. How's that? Well, we don't have anywhere to go back to, Kevin reminded her. We don't really have any other options. At least you guys won't have to sleep in the living room, Jen said. Ken moved out years ago, and I'm staying at my dorm at school, so our rooms are free. She paused. Just tell Gwen and Julie not to touch my stuff. Kevin grinned, but it was brittle. What? Don't want your stuffed animals getting dirty. Jen raised an eyebrow. No, I have a special sparring robot, and it punches back hard enough for me to feel it. So unless one of you wants broken ribs, don't mess with it. I believe her, Midoriya said quietly, when Kevin looked at him in disbelief. Yeah, I'll pass, Kevin said with a wince. Pretty sure Ken healed my broken ribs, and I don't want to go through that again. Jen grinned, but it quickly faded as she walked over to Kevin and put her hand on his shoulder. You're going to be okay. Not for a while, but you will be okay. I know, I Kevin choked on his own words, and Jen caught him before he collapsed into sobs. Midoriya moved closer, not so close that he was invading Kevin's personal space, but close enough to let him know that he was there if he needed the support. I'm sorry, Midoriya said, his throat tight from fighting against his own tears. It's not fair. That's not on you, Jen said sharply. You had no control over which universes would make it. None of us did. We gave it our best shot, and we're alive to cry about it. Still doesn't feel like a win, Kevin said, once he'd regained a little composure. Jen sighed. Because it wasn't. We only get a win if everyone lives. Even if Luther had been the only one to die. I couldn't really call it a win. She looked away. Dad told me what might happen on missions like this. When universes are at stake, the best we can hope for is to limit the damage. There isn't always a way to save everyone. Those words felt like a punch to the gut for Midoriya. Ever since he'd seen that video of All Might all those years ago, all he'd wanted to do was be a hero that saved everyone. But it felt like he'd failed more than he'd succeeded. He hadn't been able to save Holo Ben. Despite all he'd done during the raid on the Eight Precepts, he blamed himself for the deaths of Snatch and Shade Dart. He'd failed to stop Luther from executing an Imo, and later, failed to save Luther himself. He had been powerless to stop Vilgax from destroying his universe. He hadn't even been good enough to die alongside the people he loved. And now, just when he thought everything was back to normal, there were countless billions that had been erased from reality. There had to have been a way to save everyone, but he just didn't see it. Next time, he swore to himself. Next time there's a crisis, I will not let anyone die. Are you okay, Ben? Kara asked. Ben sighed. Not really, Kara. I figured today would be a normal day. Instead, I faced down Vilgax. Our daughter was nearly killed, and I'm dealing with people I buried years ago. You don't have to be the one to help those three, Kara said, and rested her head on his shoulder. There are a lot of people here who would be willing to take them in for a while. Yeah, but, Ben sighed again. I couldn't help my family from my universe. Maybe this is a way to put that last ghost to rest. It's not the same, Kara reminded him. I know, but I think I'll feel better anyway. Ben kissed the top of her head and then stepped away. I'm gonna take a quick trip back home. I'll see you back at the house. Do you mind taking our three strays with you? Kara nodded. Sure thing. I'll ask Jen and Verdona to help out. What about Ken? I think he and the new Paradox are going to take Izuku back home. Right, Izuku? Ben rubbed his forehead. Man, that kid got thrown into the deep end, didn't he? At least I had a little more progression between fighting bad guys and saving universes. Kara raised an eyebrow. I noticed you're still not talking about Paradox. Ben closed his eyes. The one I knew is dead, Kara. I'm not sure I'm ready to start hanging out with his replacement yet. I get it. Kara gave him a quick kiss. I'll see you at home. Thanks for this, Ken, Midoriya said, and held up his repaired hoodie and visor. They look just like new. Technically, they are new, Ken said, and winked. I reversed time around your outfit, brought it back to the way it was before you went off on your adventure. Not what I'd call it, Jen muttered, and then pulled Midoriya into a hug. Thanks for being part of the team, cousin. Midoriya returned the hug as tightly as he could, which still meant that Jen barely felt it. Any time, cousin, but can the next time we meet be less intense? Jen laughed. We'll see. After Jen let him go, Midoriya walked over to Gwen, Kevin and Julie. I'm sorry, I wish I could do more. Gwen's eyes were still puffy from crying, but her smile was genuine. We appreciate that, but I think we'll be okay. Maybe not for a while, but we'll manage. Just don't go getting yourself in trouble, Kevin added. If we have to save your sorry butt, you'll start owing us, and you won't like how high I'll run up your bill. Midoriya grinned at him. 
I'll do my best. Hey, Izuku. Because of her eyes, Julie looked even worse than the others. Midoriya wondered if his own eyes made him look terrible after crying. Yes, Julie's own smile was sad as she hugged him. I meant what I said before. You made our Ben proud. And you should be proud of yourself. I don't think we could have done all this without you. Midoriya sighed. It doesn't feel like I should be proud. Julie shrugged and let him go. Then try to do better next time. I will. Midoriya's gaze was steady. I won't stop getting better until I can save everyone. Good attitude, Ken said, and patted him on the shoulder. But don't forget to take some time to relax, or you won't be any help to anyone. Now, come on, let's get you home. Midoriya swallowed nervously. He wanted nothing more than to go back to his universe and make sure that everyone he loved was okay. But at the same time, he worried that things weren't the way he remembered. Don't be too worried, Paradox said, as if reading his mind. There may have been tiny alterations to your timeline here and there, but nothing so drastic that you'd notice. Well, what? Midoriya demanded. Well, what? Paradox shrugged. You're now in a polyamorous relationship with both Hachako and Momo. And what? She managed to keep a straight face for almost two seconds, but then Paradox nearly doubled over with laughter. Oh, oh, your face. I don't think I've ever seen so much terror from one person before, and I visited Pompeii during the eruption. Dark, Ken commented, but shrugged. Also, yeah, that was pretty friggin' funny. Not to me. Midoriya shouted with a crack in his voice. Paradox brushed away a tear from her eye. Don't worry, your absolutely adorable relationship with your girlfriend remains the same as it was. Midoriya sighed and tried to get his heart rate back down to a healthy level. Um, you mentioned that no one remembers what happened, right? Correct, Paradox said. Mirio remembers that you were asking for his help, but as far as he recalls, you vanished right after telling him. You should fill him in, but I would be cautious in choosing who else to tell. Finding out that your entire universe died can be traumatic, even if you don't remember. Midoriya nodded. It wasn't so much a matter of trust, but a matter of not wanting to hurt his friends and family when he didn't have to. Wait, does that also mean that no one remembers that I don't have a quirk? Paradox nodded, and Ken patted him on the shoulder. Dodge the bullet there, dude. Try to avoid letting anyone else in on the secret, okay? You already told more than a dozen people. Yeah, I don't want to think about how that could have ended. Midoriya sighed. I think I'm ready to go home. Right? Paradox gestured to Ken. If you'll bring us back, I'll stop time so that no one notices us. Sounds good. Ken snapped his fingers, and Midoriya found himself standing outside the Class 1 dorm. Wait, I was at a training exercise before I left. Yes, I suppose I had to do a little rearranging. Paradox admitted. It's been a few hours since then, and your class was celebrating. As far as they know, you stepped outside for some air. Midoriya looked around with no small amount of relief. There was no smoke, no screams, and no breaches in reality. As far as he could tell, everything really was back to normal. He reached for the door, and then paused, and looked back at Paradox. What's wrong? She asked. I'm sorry, Midoriya said. For what? For taking you from your home. For taking away your chance for a normal life. You suffered even more than Mayuri, and then the crisis happened. Midoriya blinked away tears. I can never make that up to you. Paradox smiled and gently hugged him. Izuku, I'm an immortal time traveler. I spent a thousand years healing from my trauma. Now, I can travel across all of time and space to help so many others, and that's because you did what needed to be done. She saw the troubled look on Midoriya's face and gently ruffled his hair. If you really want to clear away any self-perceived debt, there is something you can do for me. Anything. Paradox pointed to the door. Inside that dorm is Yuriri. Make sure she gets to live a full life, a happy life. Make sure she knows she's loved. I will, Midoriya said. I promise. And heroes keep their promises. Paradox let him go and pushed him to the door. Come on, Ken, we should be going. You got it. Ken gave Midoriya a two-fingered salute. Don't forget to call every now and then, kid. You've got a few new friends on our side of the multiverse who'd like to hear from you. Right? Midoriya smiled. See you later. Midoriya opens the door to the dorm and smiles when he sees the rising stars and the rest of his class celebrating. Yuri runs up to him and hugs his leg, and he picks her up in his arms. He glanced over his shoulder, but Paradox and Ken are gone. Yuriraka gets his attention with a hug and a kiss and pulls him inside. He is quickly swarmed by his friends, who each give him a hug. He blushes when Yeyarazu kisses the top of his head and blinks away tears when hugging Ashido. Later, when everyone else is sleeping in the lounge from a combination of exhaustion and good food, Midoriya carefully checks on every one of them, even Bakugo. 
he searches for any sign of trauma or that they have been altered in some way by the recreation of their universe. After a while, he relents and admits to himself that Paradox was telling him the truth. He sits back down next to Uraraka, who is holding Eri in her arms, kisses both of them, and rests. Jen stands over a grave, then kneels down and places a flower. She starts to walk away, but glances back at the headstone, which reads Alexander Luther. Jen sighs, then walks over to a car, which Ken is driving. She gives him a shrug and sits in the passenger seat. She closes her eyes as Ken starts driving and smiles as the wind blows through her hair. Kara opens the door to the house and lets Gwen, Julie and Kevin inside. The three look around for a while, but Julie freezes when she sees some pictures on the wall. She waves the others over and points at a picture of Ben, surrounded by their counterparts, and the counterparts of their dead families. Julie starts to cry, and so does Gwen. Kevin holds onto Gwen with one arm and uses the other to wipe his eyes. Kara gently puts her own arms around Julie, who breaks down and sobs. Ben stands in front of several graves, his eyes closed. On his left is Ship, who gently pats one grave, on his right is Verdona, who also has her eyes closed. Ben takes a deep breath and then picks up Ship and puts him on his shoulder. He then hugs Verdona and gestures behind him. Verdona nods and opens up a portal, which they all step through. They arrive in Ben's house and see Gwen and Kevin asleep on the couch. Their eyes are still puffy from crying. Julie is sitting at the table, across from Kara. Both of them are holding steaming mugs of coffee, and both are laughing softly. They see Ben, and Kara gestures from Julie to him. Julie puts her hand over her mouth and tries not to laugh harder. Ben rolls his eyes, assuming his wife is making a joke at his expense. He smiles fondly at Gwen and Kevin, the latter of whom is starting to snore, and then walks over to Kara and kisses her cheek. Julie's smile turns a little sad. But it doesn't fade, instead, she gets up and walks around the table to Ben, and hugs him. Midoriya is alone in his room that night, he is exhausted, but unable to sleep just yet. He looks out through his window and up at the stars. He can almost see the faces of Jen, Kevin, Gwen, Julie, Luther, and both paradoxes. He then thinks about the worlds they visited, and hopes that some of them were restored. Midoriya looks down at his desk, and taps the frame of Ben's picture, and finally goes to bed. Next time, I'll do better, he promises. In the span of no time at all, Paradox steps back from observing all of them. She has much to do, but the multiverse owes its champions much, even if no one remembers why. If all she can offer is acknowledgement of their achievement, then she offers it gladly. She looks down at her watch, perhaps it is nostalgia, but the wristband is green, the favorite color of her favorite hero. It's almost time, she says quietly. Good luck, Izuku. Though he was the vice president of his class, Midoriya didn't often exercise any kind of authority he might have had. In fact, as far as Yuraraka could remember, he had never done that. So, when he asked Aizawa if he could make a request of the class during heroics, Yuraraka was as surprised as anyone. Then again, he had been acting a little strange for almost a week. Midoriya wouldn't say why, but he seemed exceedingly cautious he would often quickly glance around corners or through doorways, or do a quick headcount every time the class assembled. It was like he was expecting trouble at any moment, and needed to reassure himself that everything was fine. Other than Yuraraka, the only person who seemed to have noticed this odd behavior was Yeyurazu. But since Midoriya had been getting a little better over the last couple of days, they agreed not to bring it up. That was why Yuraraka was surprised by this abrupt announcement from her boyfriend. Sorry to bring this up, he said, once he had everyone's attention. I wanted to ask if you were all willing to spend a little extra time in heroics today. What's this about? Siro asked. Midoriya hesitated, as if he didn't quite know how to phrase it. I noticed that all of our combat-oriented lessons are either one-on-one -on -one or team versus team situations. But I don't think we've ever practiced with one of us against multiple opponents. I asked Aizawa-sensei, and he said that that's usually something we would learn next year. But after everything we've been through so far, he agreed that we should learn how to fight while outnumbered. That's why, Midoriya took a breath, I'm challenging you to a fight, all of you, against me. At the same time, the class was stunned into silence, even though they knew how strong Midoriya was, to challenge everyone at once reeked of arrogance. It was so unlike him that even Bakugo looked thrown for a moment but only for a moment. You're on, Deku. He shouted, I can't wait to make you eat dirt. This won't be a cage match, Aizawa cut in sharply. I'm going to have Cementos create some terrain that will force you all to be creative in your tactics. And I'm only allowing this because I know Midoriya can use Swampfire to heal himself. After this, we'll randomize smaller teams against one person. 
Uraraka only half listened. She was still focused on her boyfriend, who had a strangely serious look on his face. He almost seemed to be readying himself for a real fight, not a training exercise. Just what is going on with you, Izuku? Anyone else a little freaked out? Ashido asked as she and the other girls put on their costumes. Since when does Midori call us all out like that? Not even Bakugo does that. I could hear his heartbeat, Jiro said, right before he got up to talk to Aizawa-sensei. He sounded like he was about to have a panic attack. But after he started talking to us, he got really calm. Maybe this isn't just about us, Ribbit, Asui said. Maybe he's trying to prove something to himself. Gyro scoffed. What does Midoriya have to prove? He just might be the strongest hero on the planet, and he's still in high school. Whatever it is, it's his business, Yayorazu said, in a tone that clearly indicated that this was the end of the conversation. If it helps him with whatever issues he has, then we will help him by giving our all during this exercise. As the girls started to leave the locker room, those in the Rising Stars shared a concerned glance and came to the same conclusion. If this fight didn't help Midoriya, an intervention would be necessary. Midoriya didn't say a word until they arrived at Jim Gamma. Cementos was already prepared. He had created a multi-level maze out of concrete with stairs, false doors, and random holes in the walls. There was also a white line about 10 feet beyond the structure. A few ground rules, Aizawa said as the class stretched. First, no serious injuries, you fight to incapacitate, not kill. Second, this exercise ends when either Midoriya is captured, or the rest of you are unable to keep going. If you are incapacitated, I will call for a pause, and Cementos will pull you out of there before resuming. Anyone who crosses the white line is considered to have forfeited. Midoriya, since you're the target, I'm giving you a 60-second head start now. Midoriya had already turned into Ghost Freak and passed through a wall before 5 seconds passed. Everyone else took the time to finish stretching, or warm up their quirks. In the interest of fairness, Aizawa wasn't letting them strategize beforehand. But everyone knew that Midoriya knew their strengths and weaknesses better than some of them did. It was starting to look like even less of a fair fight, and not in the way the class was expecting. Back in his office, Nezu and All Might watched the extra lesson through the many small cameras Cementos had mixed in with his concrete. Nezu had been intrigued when Aizawa had told him about Midoriya's proposal, but All Might was sweating. This is insane, he said. When I was young Midoriya's age, I never would have challenged my entire class at once. To be fair, you were still getting a handle on one for all at that age, Nezu reminded him. That was why Gran Torino always pulled you aside for personal lessons, instead of letting you fight other students. Young Midoriya hasn't had that kind of All Might almost said torture, but refrained, in case Gran Torino unexpectedly burst in. Intensive training. With his powers, he could cause serious injury, which is why Cementos can open a tunnel for Aizawa to erase Midoriya-san's quirk if things get out of hand, Nezu assured him. Now, let's see how this plays out. It didn't take long for the fighting to begin. Nineteen students broke off into groups, entering the maze from different locations. It was a good idea. They could chase Midoriya down without getting picked off one by one, and keep him busy long enough for everyone else to arrive. Unfortunately, Midoriya had their number and wasn't pulling his punches. Ida was the first to fall. He was blindsided by XLR8, who knocked the wind out of him with one good kick and then frozen up to his neck by Arctic Yuana. Ciro tried to restrain him, but Big Chill passed through his tape, and Grey Matter took him down with a quick jab to a nerve cluster. Maita, remembering how Grey Matter had given him a black eye, tossed a flurry of balls in anger, but the little alien used the frozen Ida as a shield. After a moment, Terraspin blew Maita and a few strands of Ciro's tape into a far wall where he was stuck. Aizawa called for a pause as the first defeated group was withdrawn. As soon as they were gone, Midoriya was back on the hunt. And that's what it was, Nezu realized. Midoriya wasn't just fighting his classmates, but actively hunting them down. It's a lesson, he said in quiet shock. What is? All Might asked, then winced when four arms used Sato as a makeshift club to take down both Kirishima and Kaminari. Well, since Midoriya-san isn't going easy on them, he's giving his classmates a choice. Now it was Nezu's turn to wince when Wild Mutt sniffed out Hagakure, chased her down, and tackled her. They are confronted with an opponent they can't defeat, so their choices are to either run, or somehow trick him into disqualifying himself. It's like the test we gave the students before. It isn't his job to teach students, All Might argued, and then almost stood up when Shocksquatch electrocuted Gyro. Not officially, no, Nezu agreed, but we also encourage our students to help each other grow. This is a lesson that they all need to learn, no matter how bitter it may be. 
The next few minutes were a frightening display of superiority. Midoriya quickly took down all but a few of Class 1A, sometimes in rather brutal ways. Nezu was shocked when Wrath powered through a cluster of mines Yeirazu had created, then punched her clear through a window. If Yuraraka hadn't tagged her with her quirk as she flew past, she could have been seriously hurt. He's barely in control, All Might realized. It almost looks like he's fighting to kill. The villains they fight will have even less restraint, Nezu said. If anything, this will sharpen their instincts in future battles. At that point, only Uraraka, Ashido and Bakugo were left, and even Nezu was starting to get worried. With how Midoriya was acting, he might drop what little restraint he had for Bakugo. At the same time, those two girls were among those closest to Midoriya, and either side might hesitate. Bakugo tried to blast NRG, but in a cruel repeat of the sports festival, it was ineffective. Ghost Freak tried to possess him, and in the close confines of the maze, Bakugo couldn't dodge. Ghost Freak then used Bakugo to stun Yuraraka with a long-range blast, then charged in close to Ishido, who reflexively kicked between his legs. It was only then that she realized that Ghost Freak was no longer possessing him, and Bakugo fell to the floor with his hands over his groin. That was when Nezu saw it. Just before Diamond Head finished the match, Nezu saw a storm of emotions cross his face. Diamond Head was harder to read than most humans, but Nezu knew grief and self-loathing when he saw it. Then Diamond Head slammed the girl's foreheads together and Aizawa called the match. I don't like this, All Might said sharply, and left without another word. For once, Nezu didn't argue with him. Something had happened to Midoriya, something that had turned determination into ruthlessness. There had been no incidents since the fight with Gentle, so Midoriya's change in behavior was puzzling. And few things caught Nezu's attention like a good puzzle. And so, so sorry. If there was one good thing to come out of the one-sided beating, it was that Midoriya was acting normal again. He'd been babbling apologies nonstop since getting back to the dorms, and even the most reluctant of the students, except for Bakugo, accepted, if only to shut him up. Yuraraka smiled at him, even as she held a bag of ice to her aching head. Deku-kun, I'm fine. You didn't even knock me out, and I'm already feeling a little better. She paused. Still, maybe we don't share this story with our parents. I'm pretty sure mine would kill you. I'm pretty sure mine would kill me, Midoriya muttered. Yayorazu reached for her tea, and winced when her bruised ribs protested. I suppose we have some things to talk about, such as how we could have done better. That's part of it, but Midori aside, I challenged you all because we were getting used to practice matches. If we're going to fight real villains on a regular basis, we can't pull our punches like we would against each other. The rising stars wanted to protest, they hadn't held back against the eight precepts, after all. However, it had been some time since then and they had to admit that they'd fallen into habits during training that could negatively affect them in the field. I think we need another internship, Todoroki said quietly, then rubbed his jaw where four arms had backhanded him. The more experience we have in real situations, the less likely we are to hold back in training. It's only been a few weeks since our work studies, Ribbit, Asui croaked. I don't think we'll have another one for a while. Actually, it is possible, Yeyarazu said. There was a notification in my email account that I was going to bring to the attention of the entire class tomorrow. It seems that our teachers had the same idea as you, Shoto, and are allowing pro heroes to offer internships to students of their choice every month. All we have to do is get approval from Aizawa Sensei and the principal. As Midoriya considered that and felt bad that his impromptu lesson was now unnecessary, there was a knock on the door and Aizawa entered. He looked at the students in the room and shrugged. I wish there were more of you here, but whatever. We have guests, so make yourselves presentable. Before the rising stars could fully process that, five very familiar faces walked inside, and four of them struck a pose. Your feline fantasies have returned, Mandalay said happily. Pixie Bob winked. As strong as we are cute. The wild, wild pussycats are here to visit. Ragdoll finished, while Tiger merely flexed behind them. Standing behind Aizawa, Koda put his face in his hands, embarrassed with his aunt's antics. Midoriya blinked rapidly. W what? Aizawa sensei, what are the pussycats doing here? Aizawa sighed. They're rotating in for added security this week, and also volunteered to help with our rescue training. It's good to see you all, Yeyarazu said to the pussycats with a bow. I'm sorry that the rest of our class isn't here to welcome you. Mandalay waved off her apology. No worries, Aizawa told us you guys had been through a rough training session. She gestured to her civilian clothes. Besides, the intro doesn't land as well without our costumes. Ragdoll bounded over to Uraraka. Hey, kitten, how's the arm? Uraraka smiled and held up her prosthetic. Even better than my old one. 
and thanks to you, I didn't lose anything else. Ragdoll sniffed and wiped away a tear. Aw, that's so sweet. I told you she wouldn't hold a grudge, Tiger said with a laugh, and then peered closer at the students. You all look like you took a beating, except for you, Midoriya-san. Ashido gave her twin a look. Yeah, because he was the one giving out the beating. Pixie Bob did a double take. What? He took on the entire class. If you weren't spoken for. Midoriya blushed, Uraraka scowled, and the other rising stars laughed as Mandalay smacked her teammate over the head. No, bad. We've been over this. Mandalay sighed. Seriously, just use that dating site I showed you and save yourself some embarrassment. Desperate to change the subject, Midoriya waved to the young boy who looked even more embarrassed than he did. Hi, Koda. What are you doing here? Koda mumbled something and hid his face behind the brim of his hat. Mandalay grinned and put her hand on his head. Koda insisted that he be allowed to visit you, she said with a grin. There was something he really wanted to say. Midoriya knelt so that he was level with Koda though he did make sure to stay out of his reach, in case the boy tried to punch him in the groin again. Um, Koda didn't look Midoriya in the eye for a moment. I wanted to thank you, for saving my life, back at the camp. Midoriya smiled. Of course, and I also wanted to thank you for coming back alive. Koda looked uncomfortable saying the next part. I guess not every hero who goes to save people is going to die. Mandalay sniffed and scooped her nephew up in a hug. Koda began to half-heartedly flail, but his aunt didn't let go. Hey, kittens, what time is it? Pixie Bob asked. Ciro looked at his phone. Oh, about five. Why? Oh, turn on the TV. Pixie Bob started bouncing in place. They're announcing the top ten heroes soon. Wait, that's today. Midoriya leaped onto the couch and grabbed the remote. I could have sworn that was tomorrow. Ida bowed to the pussycats. My apologies. Izuku is very enthusiastic about heroes, and he was looking forward to this. How did your team place in the rankings? We moved up. Ragdoll said proudly. We placed at 27th this year. That's a huge boost, isn't it? Uraraka asked as they walked over to join Midoriya. Weren't you closer to the triple digits? It's because of the attack on the camp, Tiger explained. Our actions were heavily scrutinized, both by the government and the media. We've received quite a bit of popularity because of that. A lot of heroes who were part of major events got bumped up, Ashido added. Sky Dancer told me she finally made it past 30th place. My brother, Ingenium, actually dropped to 41st, Ida said. He was out of action for some time, after he was attacked by Stain. But he says he earned some of that back after the raid on the Eight Precepts. I wonder where Ruku landed this year, Ribbit, Asui said as she hopped onto the couch. She's usually near the bottom of the top ten, but she was a lot more active this year. How do you know that? Ciro asked. Nejire told me. Ah, uh, the pussycat stood behind the sofa while the students and Koda sat down. Midoriya's gaze never left the screen. The announcer was in the middle of her speech, going on about how this televised display of the top ten was unprecedented. But after All Might's retirement, the powers that be had decided that this was the best way to usher in a new era. Midoriya wasn't surprised that Kamui Woods made it to 10th place. He was still fairly new to being a pro hero, but his work ethic was commendable. He dealt with over a hundred cases in just this year, including the attempt to rescue Midoriya from the League of Villains, so he'd become very high profile. Yoroi Musha, the armor hero, had landed at 9th as one of the oldest active heroes in Japan. He had stayed in the top 10 for most of his career, though he'd been slowly dropping to the bottom of the pack over the last decade. The shield hero, Crust, surprised Midoriya by dropping to 8th. He was usually higher in the rankings, but after All Might's retirement, Crust had almost completely fallen off the radar, other than posting on social media that he was in mourning. He had received some criticism for that, after all, All Might wasn't even dead. In contrast, Gang Orca had shot up the rankings, ending up at 7th place. He had been at the very bottom of the top 10 for years, but his assistance of police cracked down on crime in recent months, while not as publicized as other heroes, had vastly improved his score among law enforcement. The interns of Ruku burst into cheers when she made it to 6th place. She had never gotten so high in the rankings before, usually getting 10th or 9th place. She looked positively bashful as she accepted her new position. But going by the crowds cheering for her, she deserved it. Right above Ruku in the rankings was the rabbit hero, Mirko. She had hovered near the top 10 for a while. But her popularity had soared after a few candid speeches about how heroes and the government should crack down on the League of Villains. From her flawless track record of subduing villains, Midoriya wondered if her rank would have been even higher if she'd been part of the Eight Precepts raid. Edshot took fourth place, it wasn't the first time he'd gotten into the upper half of the top ten. But Midoriya had always suspected that he would have been ranked even higher if he was more approachable. 
Then again, he was a ninja, so it made sense that he would be a little more introverted. Best genus's introduction was almost drowned out by cheers as he took third. He had been badly injured during the fight with All for One and hadn't done much work since then, but his reputation and his clothing line had kept him popular enough to move up a spot. Midoriya was just glad that he had recovered enough to be present. Midoriya couldn't help but grin proudly when Hawks was officially made the number two hero. Even with everything he'd been through, it felt pretty cool to have interned under the now number two hero in Japan. Here it comes, Todoroki muttered, out of all of them, he'd become more withdrawn as the announcements went on. Midoriya almost slapped himself, in his excitement, he had forgotten that the new top hero was well. To say that Shoto's relationship with his father was strained was like describing the fires of hell as a little on the warm side. The other rising stars gave him sympathetic looks. Ashido took Todoroki's hands in hers and leaned in close. The pussycats noticed the change in mood, but a throat-cutting motion from Asui kept them from saying anything. And now, the new number one hero Endeavor. The first thing Midoriya noticed when Endeavor walked onto the stage was his costume. He'd added off white armor to his shoulders, while the rest of his costume looked like a thinner material. He wondered what the armor was made of certainly not metal, since prolonged contact with the flame hero would melt it after a while. Does he know he's muttering? Tiger asked, as Midoriya scribbled frantically into a notebook. You get used to it after a while, Siro said dismissively. Achako thinks it's cute. Midoriya blinked and looked up at his girlfriend, who shrugged. Actually, no, it's kinda goofy. Iroraka gave him a quick peck on the cheek. You're cute, though. Everyone else cooed or laughed, except for Koda who made gagging noises in the corner. Eventually, the Pussycats and Koda said their farewells and left the students to their own devices. The mood was one of excitement, but also deep contemplation. Shoto, there is something I must ask. Ida sat with his arms crossed. You have told us of how your father treated you and your family. His behavior is utterly reprehensible, and he should have faced consequences. How has he remained a pro hero? Todoroki's cold expression was scarily reminiscent of how he used to be during the sports festival. Money, the bastard paid off anyone who might have blown the whistle on him. The only reason my brother and sister didn't say anything is because we were worried he'd threaten our mom. Did he? Ashido asked. Threaten her, I mean. No, thankfully. Todoroki took a deep breath. But we were always scared that he might. That's why I thought I could get revenge just by using my mom's he stopped. Then smiled at Midoriya. By using just the ice half of my quirk. Do you ever want to go after him with a legal team? Yeyarazu looked thoughtful. I could ask my parents what kind of lawyers they could refer. No, it's fine. Still, Todoroki had a far-off look on his face that suggested he was imagining what kind of legal power he could bring to the table with Yeyarazu family funding. He can't hurt me anymore, and I'm patching things up with mom. Thanks for the offer, though. Siro coughed to get their attention. Okay, drama aside, how cool is it that half of us have interned with some of the top heroes in Japan? Midoriya had to agree, until a thought occurred to him. Hey, did any of you notice that the announcer never said the words in Japan? It was like she was saying that we were the only country that had heroes. Yuraka frowned. Huh, now that you mention it, I think you're right. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm proud of Japan's heroes, Midoriya went on. But there are plenty of amazing heroes around the world. There's Stars and Stripes, Gentleman Jack, Maccabee, Monkey King no one ever talks about them on the news. That got the other rising stars thinking. As far as they could remember, mainstream Japanese media never reported on foreign heroes, even on the rare occasion one visited. It was almost like the media thought heroes from outside Japan weren't worth talking about. They had no idea if other countries acted the same way, that only their heroes were discussed. But Japan was also the only country that didn't send heroes to international task forces. Before Midoriya could think too hard about that, his phone started to ring. At first, he thought his parents were calling to discuss the hero rankings, because he'd always talked to them about it in previous years, until he saw the caller ID. Why is Hawks calling me? He wondered, and answered the phone. Hello. Hey, kid, what's up? Hawk's voice was almost manic, like he'd had too much coffee. Did you see the new rankings? Pretty cool, right? Why yeah, it is. Congratulations. Thanks. Don't get me wrong, I worked hard, but part of me never thought I'd get so high in the rankings before I hit 25. Hey, I heard your class would be open for internships again. Midoriya blinked at the abrupt topic change. Uh, yes. Cool. Any chance I could snag you for that week? as if there was any other answer Midoriya could give. Absolutely. Awesome. I'll have Yuki pick you up on Friday. See you later, kid. Midoriya stared at his phone for a moment, and then turned to his friends. I guess I'm interning with Hawks this week. All right, Hawks, what's this about? What? I can't spend time with my favorite intern. 
playing cool only works with your fans, not us. Hey, you wanted Midoriya under surveillance, and now I'll be able to keep an eye on him for a whole week. I thought you'd be happy. Fine, as long as you can keep the boy away from the rodent. Sure thing. Oh, and I'll need something else to keep my cover intact for my other assignment. Go on. So, just to be clear everything is fine now. Midoriya nodded. Yes, Tagata didn't like the way Midoriya's eyes kept darting about. Even though they had found a secluded spot to talk, he had demanded that they both check every inch for any way someone could eavesdrop. After 20 minutes of paranoia, even Tagata had started to lose his patience. It had been a week since Midoriya and that other girl, Julie, he vaguely remembered, had started asking him for his help. The details didn't always stay in his mind, which was concerning, but Midoriya had hinted that that was okay. In fact, he had suggested that Tagata not ask too many questions about a mission that he couldn't remember going on. Tagata didn't accept that, and had all but ordered Midoriya to tell him the truth. So he did. Being told something was a far cry from actually remembering it. So being told that he had died was well. It wasn't easily brushed off, but since he didn't remember, it wasn't as traumatizing as Midoriya had clearly feared. There was also a lot that he couldn't wrap his head around, like ancient magic and the beginning of time itself. What he could understand was that the good guys had won, and the bad guys were gone, though there had been a price to pay. How many people, how many universes didn't make it? Midoriya shrugged. Nobody was sure. They were basically erased from time. So unless you were outside of one of those universes when they were destroyed, you wouldn't remember they existed at all. That's oh, that makes my brain hurt. But, um, everyone from our universe is safe. To God aside. That's good, I guess. What happens now? Midoriya shrugged again. Nothing. We finished the mission, and now we can get back to our lives. Or, try, I guess. It'll probably be easier for the rest of us, since we can't remember. Tagata put his hand on Midoriya's shoulder. Are you okay? Midoriya sighed. I don't know. It's still pretty raw right now. I know I can talk to Ben and his family if I need to. But, you want to see if you can go without needing help. Tagata finished. Yeah. Midoriya took a deep breath. You know, I think Nejire saw you pull me away. All our friends probably know where we are by now. Good point. I can just tell them that I wanted to run my newest quirk by you, see if you had any cool ideas. Thanks, I. Midoriya blinked. New quirk. What new quirk? Tagata grinned. He'd successfully gotten the truth out of Midoriya, and now his distraction had worked. Well, I can float through the air. Midoriya was already hard at work, scribbling away in a notebook. Tagata felt no small amount of relief behind his smile. For now, Midoriya seemed to be doing all right. Dr. Garaki swiveled in his chair when he heard the door open. Off Dabai, how good to see you again. How's Shigaraki's progress with Gigantamasia? Well, he's not dead, Dabai said with a shrug. Don't know how the guy can keep going for this long. I saw Nine walk by on my way here. You gave him another healing quirk. Garaki sighed heavily, and his bushy mustache fluttered as he did so. Nine is an amazing specimen, don't get me wrong, but his quirk factor is annoyingly stubborn. It's so hard to find a healing quirk that won't burn out or get rejected. I had hopes for the last one, but it only lasted six days. What about this new one? Dabai asked. Garaki shrugged. Similar to the last, but less powerful overall. I'm hoping that the energy required won't conflict with his other quirks and will last longer because of it. If it lasts at least three weeks, I'll be able to narrow down the parameters further and maybe find that perfect match. Now, while I appreciate your interest in my work, I know it's not genuine. Why are you really here, Dabai? Now it was Dabai's turn to shrug. I heard a rumor about a couple of top heroes going to Kyushu and thought it'd be a good idea to see if we could kill one of them. Even if we can't, a big attack right after the new rankings should keep people nervous. The longer the league can get away with this kind of stuff, the more the sheep are gonna lose trust in the shepherds. Well, that's surprisingly deep, my friend. Garaki laughed and then pressed a few keys on his laptop. I've just awakened one of my greatest creations, a high-end Namu. I call him Hood, he'll need half a day to fully acclimate. But once he does, well, even if he fails to kill a top hero, it'll provide me with all kinds of useful data. Dabai nodded. Sounds good, Doc. I'll make sure you get a hell of a show. Rather than take a train to Kyushu, where Hawks wanted to meet him, Midoriya was picked up by a car just outside UA. It was certainly a nice car, but other than being red, there was nothing to indicate that it belonged to Hawks. Midoriya assumed Hawks didn't want the car swarming with fans when he wanted to pick up his intern. Hey, Midoriya. Take the waved as Midoriya got into the back seat. Been a while, huh? Hi, Yuki-san. Midoriya noticed something different and smiled. I like your hero costume. Thanks. Take the beamed. It's hard to find something that works well with my quirk. 
Keikda's costume consisted of a white sleeveless top and pants, with a pink jacket that looked several sizes too big. The jacket also seemed to be made of flexible hexagons, rather than any cloth or leather. Midoriya also noticed a silver band around Takeda's neck that looked like a sleeker version of some quirk-suppressing technology. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what is your quirk? It's called Enhanced, Takeda explained. I generate this energy from my shoulders that spreads to my whole body. It makes me stronger and faster. And it improves my thought process so that my mind can keep up with my body. Midoriya was already writing that down. Is there a drawback? Is that why you have that jacket? Is it a support item? Take the chuckled ruefully. Yeah, I've got one kinda annoying problem. If I use my quirk for too long, it can cause overheating in my muscles. The jacket helps vent excess heat. If I push even further, I can black out, and I can't remember anything that happened for days. That's why I've got the quirk suppressor, it kicks in if I reach dangerous levels. That sounds like a dangerous problem, Midoriya observed. It's not as bad as it sounds, and I've learned to always fight in a team. That way, I don't have to push myself that far. Take the shrugged. But enough about me, how are things at school? You ever go out with that girl you were on the phone with after the thing in Hasu? The conversation made the trip seem much shorter than it was, and before Midoriya knew it, he was in Kyushu. Take the rolled down Midoriya's window, and Hawks leaned in. Hey, kid, how's it going? Sorry, but I wanted to get a patrol in today, so do you mind getting into costume? Yuki can give you some space. Oh, uh, sure. Midoriya waited until Takeda was out of the car and was thankful for the tinted windows before getting his costume out of its case. He left his school uniform neatly folded in the case and got out of the car where dozens of people were clamoring around Hawks and Takeda. Sorry, folks, I wish I could stay and chat, but my sidekick and my intern here need to cover a lot of ground today, Hawks said. Is something wrong? A civilian asked. Hawks blinked. Huh? Oh, sorry, nothing like that. It's just that a couple of heroes who normally cover this area came down with the flu and asked me to help him out. Since Kyushu is my own backyard, I couldn't say no. Suitably assured, the crowd dispersed, though a few lagged behind to wave at Midoriya, who shyly waved back. Looks like you're getting popular, Hawks said to him. I didn't get any kind of publicity until I actually went pro, but you took down the head of a major crime syndicate right after getting a provisional license. You're gonna make the rest of us look bad. He already has, Takeda said, and rolled her eyes. Overclock, did you leave your phone in the car again? Hawks asked suddenly. Takeda, or Overclock, since they were now working, glared at him. I forget one time, and you never let me hear the end of it. Okay, but did you? Overclock hesitated, and then sighed. Be right back. Bit of a lesson for you, kid, Hawks said as Overclock dove into the car. Some missions will have you using an earpiece or something, but it's always good to have more than one way of communicating with people, just in case. Midoriya nodded, and made a mental note to keep his phone with him at all times. Got my phone, Overclock said brightly. So you did forget. Hawks teased. Blame Deku, Overclock pouted. He was distracting me with stories about his girlfriend. Which of those girls are you dating again? Hawks asked as they started their patrol. Not the pink one, you called her your twin is it the tall one, with the black hair. Or the frog girl. No, wait, it's the one who uses those mechanical wings. You just listed all of them. Overclock protested. By process of elimination, you are going to be right eventually. And that's why they pay me the big money, Hawks joked. Midoriya decided to ignore the prying into his personal life. Um, Hawks, did you really want me to intern with you because some heroes are out sick? Huh? Nah, that was just a coincidence. Hawks scratched the back of his head. I really did want to have you intern with me again, but I was actually hoping to have a more relaxed time. I know you've been through a lot over the last couple of months. You have no idea, Midoriya thought. He then spotted movement out of the corner of his eye and froze. Is that who I think it is? Hawks spotted the incoming hero in question and flinched. Oh crap. Um, overclock, can you run interference with the press over there? I think I'm gonna have to have a really uncomfortable conversation. Overclock blinked, then grinned. Sure thing, boss. She elbowed Deku before she left. Pay attention, kiddo, you're gonna love this. Shut it. Hawks hissed as his sidekick skipped away. A moment later, a woman with tan skin and white hair bounded over. She had long white rabbit ears, and a rabbit's tail poking out the back of a white leotard that had a crescent moon symbol on her chest. Her leggings, which did nothing to hide her muscular thighs, ended in a pair of shoes shaped like a rabbit's feet. Hey, pretty bird, Mirko said with a shit-eating grin. Miss me. About as much as a migraine, Hawks muttered, though Mirko's ears picked it up. How are you doing, Mirko? Mirko laughed and hopped over to a gobsmacked Deku. Aw, you brought the kid in again. 
That's cute that you still need backup to reach the number 2 spot. Ox shrugged. I either get a support system in place or I burn out, and I'd rather not lose my hair before I'm 30. Hey, don't get me wrong, I like working on my own, but this kid Mirko ruffled Deku's hair. From what I've seen, he could actually keep up with me. Mind if I steal him for an internship? Deku blinked. Huh? Mirko laughed. Oh, you didn't tell him, Hawks. She elbowed Deku, and her superhuman strength nearly knocked him over. After that thing with the Yakuza, a lot of top heroes want you to intern with them but Hawks called dibs. Deku took a moment to process the fact that some of the best heroes in Japan wanted him to sign on with them, and also that they were fighting over him like children with a new toy. W well, I'm happy working with Hawks, he managed. Lots of people are happy with him, Mirko said with a saucy grin, especially when he loosens up after a few drinks, right? Can we please not talk about this right now? Hawks said quietly, seriously, at least wait until we're indoors before you go saying stuff like that. Fine, be that way. Mirko glanced at a nearby restaurant. How about I treat you boys to lunch? What about overclock? Deku asked. Hawks glanced in the direction his psychic had gone. Eh, she likes to eat by herself. Come on, never refuse free food from another hero. New development, the rabbit has intercepted the bird. Can you intervene? Negative, they're already out of range. What are my orders? Continue to play the obedient psychic, but be prepared to call and back up. We have sources that hint at a possible attack. Understood. Soldier, out. Though there were a few other customers in the restaurant, none of them gave the heroes any serious attention. At least, not after Mirko gave them a fierce glare. She then dragged Hawks and Deku to a private booth, far away from everyone else. So, Mirko said after they ordered food, I'm guessing Hawks here told you about what happened. And no. Deku looked at Hawks, who looked like he wished he was anywhere else. He didn't even tell me he knew you. Mirko snickered. Considering the night before, I guess he'd have a hard time remembering what happened. Deku took about five seconds to figure out what she was talking about. Wait, you and Hawks. It's been six months and she still messes with me about that. Hawks muttered and then looked Deku in the eye. Look, kid, heroes can lead stressful lives and we all need ways to blow off steam. If we don't, we're liable to snap or get drunk and mess around, Mirko said, her grin never fading. Hawks sighed, but before he could comment, he saw Mirko's ears twitch. What is it? Dunno. Mirko frowned. Sounds like jet engines. Whatever it is, it's coming fa. The wall abruptly exploded inwards, and a dark, twisted form burst in. For a brief, terrifying instant, Deku thought that it was one of Vilgax's twisted drones that had somehow survived. Then he saw the exposed brain within the long, snake-like neck, behind the glowing eyes and long teeth, and realized it was a Namu. Its arms were long, and would have brushed the ground even if it wasn't hunched over. Behind its shoulders were two organic vents that pushed out air with enough force to let it fly. WH which of YU is SS strongest? The Namu shouted. Deku didn't know what surprised him more, that the Namu could speak, or that he seriously considered that it was after him. Get him outside. Hawks shouted. Finally, with a wide grin, Mirko flipped over the table and kicked the Namu in the chest, sending him flying back through the hole in the wall. She rolled, then jumped after the Namu. Hawks and Deku, now Diamond Head, hurried after her. Mirko was crouched on top of a dented car. She had her eyes fixed on the Namu, while she pulled a frightened civilian out of the car. Why you're as strong? The Namu growled at her. But in not strong enough. I w want a R real challenge. Oh, I'm just getting started. Mirko jumped off the roof of the car with enough force to shatter it, and brought her foot up to the Namu's face. This time, her kick was slapped aside. She tried to correct in midair, but the Namu wrapped his hand around her waist and slammed her head first into the pavement. Before he could hurt her further, a dozen foot long shards of crystal punched into his chest. Let her go. Diamond had ordered. You want to fight? Then try me. Hawks looked at him sharply. Deku, you can't. He shook his head. Never mind. You probably can take him. I'll work on evacuating this area. Just don't let him leave this spot, okay? Understood, Diamond had said, and scowled when the Namu pulled the shards out of his chest and healed almost immediately. This is going to be annoying. You have no idea, Hawks thought as his feathers zipped around, snagging Mirko and any nearby civilians and pulling them to safety. Guys, Kaminari tore through the dorms, shouting at the top of his lungs. Guys, get out here, now. Ashido, who had been taking a nap, opened her door and rubbed her eyes. This better be good, Kaminari, or I'm melting your phone. 
We need to turn on the news, right now, Kaminari told her breathlessly. Midoriya is fighting Anamu in Kyushu. Ashido's skin turned a noticeably lighter shade of pink as the blood drained from her face. Wordlessly, she sprinted to the television downstairs, where several other students were already watching, including Iraraka. Ashido reached out to her and pulled her into a hug as she watched Midoriya squaring off with the weirdest Namu any of them had ever seen. Hawks is helping get civilians out of there, Yuraraka said quietly, not taking her eyes off the screen. But the Namu already took down Mirko, so it's just Izuku out there. He'll be fine, Ashido assured her, though she wasn't completely sure if the trembling she felt wasn't her own. He took down Chisaki, and that Namu from USJ, right. It doesn't mean I'm not worried. Yuraraka bit her lip. I just wish we were there to help him. Ashido winced when she saw the Namu grab Diamond Head by the face and punch him over and over. Yes so do I. With a grunt, Deku turned into Big Chill, partially to escape the Namu's grasp, and also to freeze his arm with a gust of ice breath. The outer layers of skin froze and shattered, only to regenerate a moment later. He's healing even faster than the Namu from USJ, Big Chill muttered. Hawks, how's the evacuation? Almost done. Hawks shouted back. Mirko is waking up, so once she's back on her feet, she can help clear out the last couple of blocks, and then we'll help you put that guy down. Thanks. The Namu laughed, as stalling for tea time. You and need backup, hero. You're smarter than you look, Big Chill said, and then turned into an RG. Then again, that's not a hard feat. There was more laughter, even as the Namu charged. He slammed both his fists into an RG, but his armor held. NRG grabbed one arm, and his armor began to glow, the Namu's flesh warped and sizzled, but before the damage spread too far, the Namu tore his own arm off and jetted back. NRG fired a beam of radiation at his face, which the Namu blocked with his remaining arm. The radiation slowed down the regeneration, but not by much, but that wasn't what caught Deku's attention. When he blocked that attack, he was desperate, he thought. That shot would have hit his brain. Are all Namu weak there? To test his hypothesis, NRG fired again. This time, the Namu flew into the air to outright dodge the attack. That's smart. The Namu crowed. Be but as smart won't be beat me. Oh, I think it will, NRG said. You might be strong, but you're still weaker than me. That made the Namu still. What did you say? NRG surprised even himself when he laughed. You're a monster, and I beat monsters. The Namu roared and rocketed back down at him. NRG raised his arms to block, but the Namu's arms stretched out and around his guard to sweep his legs out from under him. On his back and with no leverage, NRG was smashed into the street over and over. His armor held, but being pummeled by a hideous monster wasn't a pleasant experience. He kicked the Namu off him and heated up his entire body. Come and get it, NRG taunted. Again, the Namu roared, but before he reached NRG, a white blur crashed into him from behind. Nice grit, kid. Now I really want to steal you from Hawks. No, I found him first. Hawks called out. Mirko laughed, and when the Namu tried to swat her aside, she suddenly flew over the attack. NRG knew she couldn't have naturally pulled off such a move, and wasn't surprised when he saw a pair of Hawks feathers sticking to her back. They wouldn't grant her true flight, but with Hawks controlling them, Mirko had a better chance of keeping up with. If NRG had eyes, they would have went wide with horror as the Namu's arm stretched far longer than it should have to snag Mirko's leg. He flinched when he heard the sound of bone cracking, but that was all he was going to let the Namu get away with. He turned into Buzz Shock, and then Ultimate Buzz Shock, and by the time Mirko could register the pain in her leg, the arm holding her had been severed by a crackling blade of electricity. Mirko fell to one knee, clutching the other and glaring up at the retreating Namu. Damn it, I can't keep up with him when he's in the air like that. And you're in no shape to fight anyway, Hawk said as he jogged over to her. Seriously, I think you have a concussion. How did you talk me into helping you with that stunt anyway? Mirko grinned, despite the pain she was in. You can't say no to me, remember. Whatever, bunny girl. They got him a punch to the shoulder, but he ignored it in favor of watching Ultimate Buzzshock pursuing the Namu. That one's new. I didn't know Buzzshock was one of his special forms. Mirko followed his gaze, and her eyes went wide when Ultimate Buzzshock broke part into segments, and the spinning blades cut and burned. Aren't you going to go up there? He's your intern, until I steal him. Hawk sighed. Honestly, I think I'd get in the way of that fight. That Namu is a power type, and I suck at dealing with those. Also well, this fight's gonna get the kid noticed, just like the thing with the eight precepts. You want him to take that kind of spotlight. Hawks thought about his mission, and how Midoriya now factored into it. Something like that. Midoriya was no xenophobe, but he had started to come to the conclusion that there were some creatures that were just too awful to let live. Each Namu he had seen had been a mindless beast, which was already terrifying 
This thing, however, seemed to revel in every blow given and taken in return. More. The monster shouted. Give me more. I w want to test my strength. At that point, Ultimate Buzzshock was ready to give everything he had. He had managed to push the monster into the air, away from the streets and the civilians, but there was a very real risk that the Namu could push through his pieces and get back to the ground. That could not be allowed to happen. With less hesitation than he should have felt about taking a life, he sent out two of his segments to slash apart the Namu's jets. Four more spinning blades cut off his limbs, and a fifth cut deep into his brain. There was a shriek of agony and denial, and then the lights of his eyes dimmed. The many segments slowly lowered back to the ground, Ultimate Buzzshock let the Namu's corpse gently fall, and then reconstituted himself before going back to normal. Looks like it's over, Hawk said quietly, and patted Deku's shoulder. It was a Namu, kid. Don't be too hard on yourself. Besides, the government already has a standing kill on side order for these things. Deku took a long, shuddering breath. Is everyone okay? Hawks blinked. Yes, it was the responsible reaction for a hero to be worried about civilians after an incident. But there was an almost desperate need in Deku's voice. He sounded fragile, like not hearing good news would break him. Well, Mirko's gonna have to get her leg fixed up. But other than some damage to the street, everything's fine. Deku closed his eyes and smiled. Hawks didn't know why, but it looked like Deku had resolved something for himself. He was about to say something lighthearted, so that his intern would snap out of whatever he was going through, when he saw Overclock at the end of the street. She was mouthing something at him, and his eyes were sharp enough to read her lips. What she said made his blood run cold, but at the same time, it presented an opportunity he may never have again. Come on, kid, he said gently. The fight's over, but we're not done being heroes. Uraraka silently thanked every deity she could think of that Midoriya was okay. It was one thing to fight alongside her boyfriend and be there if he needed her. It was another thing entirely to helplessly watch him fight a monster that had tossed aside a top 10 hero. By the end of the fight, the entire class had gathered around the TV. There had been no shortage of gasps when Mirko had been taken out of the fight, and few of the students had thought that Midoriya, a mere student, had actually stood a chance. But then he had, he had fought the Namu off, and then won. They should have known that he was capable. After all, he had beaten Chisaki, but some of them had wondered if that had been a fluke. Now, after defeating a monster that had stood up to Mirko, it was clear to everyone. Midoriya was a pro-hero in all but name. Mission in progress. The air plans to meet with the wild card. Understood, soldier. Maintain distance, only interact if necessary. Copy, Midoriya waited impatiently for news on Mirko. She had been taken to the nearest hospital, and after Midoriya and Hawks had given their initial reports to the police, they had quickly followed after her. She'll be fine, Hawks assured him for the eighth time. Trust me, she's taken way worse than this in her career. Seriously, it's a rare month that the news doesn't report on her breaking something. She'll be up and kicking butt by next week. Midoriya nodded. I just need to be sure. If I had been a little faster, hit the Namu harder, maybe she would. Whoa, hold up, kid. Hawks lightly flicked his ear. It is not your responsibility to look after us, okay? It's the other way around. He grinned. Now, if you become the number one hero, then I'll accept you trying to keep me safe. For now, you're a kid, and you should enjoy it while it lasts. Midoriya tried not to wince. Barely two weeks ago, it had been his responsibility to save everyone. And in many ways, he had failed. Untold billions were erased, and only a few people in the multiverse even knew they'd existed at all. Realistically, he knew he couldn't be everywhere at once, but he'd be damned if he didn't try. He's right, you know, a familiar voice said. Maybe try to have some fun before you become an adult, son. Izuku whirled. Dad, what are you doing here? Isashi grinned. What? I can't say hi to my only son. His smile quickly faded. Actually, someone important asked me to join him when he saw you. Izuku blinked as a tall man in a tailored suit stepped around his father. He was thin, with sharp features, an even sharper nose, and a receding hairline. Izuku couldn't tell what his quirk was, except for a small blot on his forehead that seemed to move on its own. Greetings, young man, he said, hands clasped behind his back. I am Yatsubashi Rikia. I believe you know of my company, Detnarat. Izuku only needed a second to realize that this was his father's boss. More than that, this was a man who could very well destroy almost anyone with a few well-placed calls. Detnarat was a company that was mainly based in Japan, but it had branches across the world. They dealt with everything from the most basic commerce to hero support technology. It was quite possibly Japan's most successful company in decades, but that was almost entirely due to the genius and ruthless economic strategies of Yatsubashi. I, um, do, Yatsubashi-san. Izuku bowed. 
It's an honor to meet you. Gatsubashi laughed. Behind him, Hisashi looked relieved. Oh, none of that, young man. I didn't come here to see you kowtow to me. Izuku heard Hawks snicker and resisted the urge to glare at him. Then, um, why are you here? Well, I saw your impressive battle on the news, and I happened to be in our Kyushu office, going over some numbers with Hisashi. He was so proud of your victory, but at the same time, you are his son and he was worried. I must admit that I took advantage of his concern, and took the opportunity to accompany him. I've been waiting for a chance to meet you for some time. Emmy, Yatsubashi laughed again. Oh, yes. You see, I learned from your parents that you're quite the meta enthusiast, just like me. And with a meta ability such as yours, I couldn't pass up the chance to speak with you. Izuku blinked at the use of the term meta. It had fallen out of favor generations ago, when the governments of the world began using quirks. Then again, considering what he had learned about what Azmuth had done to his earth, perhaps meta was actually more appropriate. Um, sure, Izuku said after a moment to process. I'd be honored to. Yatsubashi grinned. Delightful. Why don't we sit down while Hawks goes to check on Mirko, eh? Hawks bowed quickly in the man's direction. Don't worry, sir, I'll take care of it. I'm sure she's fine, but the kid's been worried. Ah, so full of compassion, Yatsubashi said with a smile, and Izuku ducked his head in embarrassment. Anything to report? Soldier asked as Hawks walked up to Mirko's room. The kid's got the target's full focus right now, Hawks said. I hate to throw him under the bus like that but the kid might be the only person in the world the target is more interested in than me. Not for long. Soldier stepped away from the door she'd been guarding. I predict ten minutes, at absolute most. Well, I'll be done in five or six. Hawks hesitated. The kid's dad was an unexpected surprise. Could he be collaborating? Doubtful. The top brass investigated the entire Midoriya family once they found out what the kid could do. Isashi might work for the company, but he's oblivious to its real dealings. He's the perfect cover. He might also be useful to the enemy as a hostage to get the boy to obey them. Now that, I can agree with. Once operations begin, we'll need to make getting Hisashi to safety a priority. That way, the kid won't hold back. Rescue might not be an option, Soldier pointed out. It might be more advantageous in the long run to eliminate Hisashi, make the kid think the enemy killed his father. Like hell, Hawks all but snarled. You want to use Izuku as a weapon against these bastards, fine. But I'll be damned before I let you kill his dad. I want you and your bosses to understand that. Soldier didn't even blink at his sudden vitriol. They are your bosses too. Not when it comes to stuff like this. Or do I have to remind everyone about Lady Nagant? Bringing up the blackest mark of the HPSC was enough to make even Soldier take a step back. That won't be necessary. Good. Now get the hell out of my way. Soldier stepped aside. Her head was bowed, but Hawks could see the hatred for him in her eyes. He just smirked and walked into Mirko's room. Hey, bunny girl, he greeted. How's the head? Mirko, slightly loopy from painkiller, grinned at him. What? Worried I have brain damage. No, you don't have enough of a functioning brain to damage, you psycho. Hawks sat down in a chair and propped his feet up on the edge of Mirko's bed. Seriously, you good? Mirko scoffed. Please, I'll be up and back on patrol in three days, tops. She paused. I'm guessing I lost a few fans today. The opposite, in fact. Hawk's smile was bitter. The press are spinning it so that people think you're so good that you were able to survive an enemy that had clear advantages over you with just minor injuries. It's giving people more hope that the League and their monsters can be beaten. It's just a matter of time. He paused when he remembered something. By the way, thanks to the kid, we've confirmed that causing catastrophic brain damage to Anamu will put it down. So, go for the head. Go for the head. Hawks shared a quick laugh with Mirko. Hey, if you don't mind, I wanted to give you something. Your phone number. Mirko teased. Hell no. Hawks reached into his coat and pulled out a book. You're gonna be stuck in here for at least a couple of days, right? Here's something to read in the meantime. Mirko narrowed her eyes. Even addled as she was, she could tell that something was off. What makes you think I like reading? It's that, or you try using this hospital's terrible Wi-Fi. Hawks held out the book. Don't worry, I mark the good parts for you. Yeah, okay. Mirko took the book. At least I won't be as bored. Hawks laughed, but it was tinged with exhaustion. With what's coming, boredom is the least of our problems. I have to say, your meta ability might be one of the most impressive I've ever heard of, Yatsubashi gushed. You called in genetic instability, yes. I can only imagine how frightening they can be, despite the power. Izuku's hand drifted to the scars on his arm. Why, yes, it can be. It's also fascinating how some of the most potent meta abilities either require an outside stimulation or have some kind of drawback, Yatsubashi went on. 
Your watch, for instance. Izuku also thought about Yeirazu's reliance on her supply of lipids, and Asui's environmental weaknesses. It's nothing like the comic books, he admitted. All those stories had superheroes without any kind of limit. The two of them had been discussing Izuku's various aliens not that Yatsubashi knew what they really were before shifting to quirks in general. Yes, it's a shame that isn't the case now, though I imagine the writers of those stories didn't consider real-world biology. Um, if it's all right, Izuku said carefully, can I ask what your power is? Yatsubashi chuckled. I'm afraid it's nothing flashy, nothing that could let me be a hero, anyway. He tapped one finger against the spot on his forehead. This little spot is my meta ability. It can move to any part of my body, and grows when I'm stressed. Like I said, no practical use, though I did use it to entertain myself and my friends when I was a child. S sorry, don't be, Yatsubashi said. I'm quite happy with my life. Besides, I've seen how stressful the life of a hero can be, so my spot would probably cover my entire body by now. He looked at his watch. Oh dear, look at the time. As much as I've wanted to meet you, young man, I'm afraid that I have quite the busy schedule. Hisashi, we must be going. Of course, sir. Hisashi gave his son a quick hug. I'll talk to you tonight, Izuku. And great work today, I'm so proud of you. Thanks, dad. Izuku's smile dropped. Um how mad is mom going to be? Hisashi went pale. Oh, I guess I'll find out, and I'll text you if you need to hide. Yatsubashi laughed again. In that case, I'd better not keep you, Hisashi. And young man, when you become a pro hero, don't hesitate to call Datnaret if you need a sponsorship to start up. Izuku blinked. Th thank you, sir. I'll definitely keep that in mind. After Yatsubashi and his father were gone, Izuku thought he could finally relax in the hospital's waiting room. That lasted all of five seconds, because his phone started to buzz, and he saw his messenger app blowing up. Comet, are you okay? Frog, stop getting into fights with monsters without us, Ribbit. Crayon, Shoto's gonna give you some ice when you get home, cause I'm gonna smack you. Book, normally, I would be against such violence, but in this case, I will help her. Glasses, and so will I. Izuku, you are very reckless. Tape, kinda cool, though. Tape, when you get back and see the weird mark on my face, know that Sue just hit me with her tongue. Snowflake, you're doomed, Izuku. Run for your life. Izuku sighed, and wondered if he should book a hospital room in advance. I assume the operation went well, sir. Of course, curious. I made contact with the Midoriya boy, and I'm certain I made a good impression. In fact, I've never seen anyone his age so quickly stop using the term quirks and use meta, or simply call them powers. We may not even need Hisashi as leverage to get him on our side. I can't say I share your optimism, Redistro. Obviously, it will take more convincing to sway him to our ideals, but I've got my foot in the proverbial door. It's a start, if nothing else. As you say, Redistro. What about our upcoming operation? According to Skeptic, we are on schedule. He has agents ready to apprehend the target as soon as he is alone. They'll have to be fast and lucky. Every one of my investigations indicate that he might be more dangerous than even nine. Locke has nothing to do with it, they know exactly what they're doing. Hawks brooded in his office, silently hating himself with every beat of his heart. After the incident in Kyushu, Midoriya had been debriefed by the police, and then sent back to UA early. The official explanation was that the appearance of Anamu meant that the League of Villains was active again, and the students' safety was paramount. If Hawks hadn't known better, he would have even said it was true. You know, I think you might be the first person I've ever hated, he said, glaring at the other person in the room. Soldier stared back impassively. I'm doing my duty. No, you're obeying your programming, Hawk spat. The kid doesn't deserve to be treated like a threat. It has nothing to do with his personality or ideals, Soldier said. Anyone with that kind of power is a threat, and will be observed. We took the opportunity to plant a monitoring device that wouldn't be detected by Nezu. You bugged a kid, got him it. Hawk's feathers broke off from his back and surrounded Soldier like a cloud of daggers. In response, yellow energy creeped out from under her sleeves. Don't even bother, if I wanted you dead, you'd be skewered before your energy covered your head. If you aren't going to go through with your threat, why bother? Soldier didn't sound alarmed. The personality the HPSC had implanted in Takeda didn't have the ability to feel fear. I'm trying to get across how pissed off I am. Hawks gripped the edge of the desk hard enough to make his hands hurt. Your bosses are crossing a line, and it's going to bite them in the ass. If it means the security and stability of this society, then any and all measures will be taken. Soldier remained stoic. Remember, Takami, nobody is irreplaceable. Hawks' own expression could have been carved from stone as his feathers returned to his back. He knew that he and the HPSC were at a stalemate. They could kill or imprison him for defying them, 
but not before he revealed the truth about Lady Nagant and their many other dirty dealings to the world. If you do anything more than observe the kid he trailed off, but the warning in his voice was clear. Two years ago, he never would have considered defiance. Apparently, having Midoriya as his intern had awakened a protective side of himself he hadn't known about. On the other side of Japan, a team of agents took shifts watching the feed from a tiny drone that Soldier had planted on Midoriya's school uniform. As soon as the boy had returned to school, the drone flew to the corner of his room and waited. The true handlers of Japan's heroes were tired of the mystery that was Midoriya Izuku, and they were determined to get some answers. Kaimira took a long drag from his last cigar and glanced at Spinner. He finally asleep. Yeah, Spinner winced as he poked his bruised arm. Why did all for one have to stuff Makia with so many quirks? Everything we do to that monster regenerates by the time he wakes up again. Chimera didn't mind Spinner's use of the word monster. After all, they were both mutant types, and if anyone had claimed to that word, it was them. It's been a month since Shigaraki started this mess, Chimera grumbled. At this point, I just want someone to win. At least we get to sit out the next round, Spinner reminded him. Those were the rules Shigaraki and Gigantamesha agreed on. Every other round, we help out in the fight. Good, because I could use a break, I think I sprained my tail. Chimera blew away the smoke from his cigar and sniffed the air. Toga and Slice are back. Spinner tensed slightly. What about twice? Dunno. Chimera rose to his feet. Let's find out. The two women of the league were in a chipper mood as they returned to the camp. Maybe it was because they looked clean and wore fresh clothes, unlike everyone else. Chimera opened his mouth to speak, but Slice tossed him a box of cigars, followed by some food. I was about to be mad at you, but now I'm not, Chimera said, and happily stuffed the cigars into his coat pocket. When did you have time to get cleaned up? Slice grinned and ran a hand through her shimmering hair. Toga got the blood of a hotel worker and the keys she got us inside a vacant room to shower in and got us some clean clothes. And you couldn't do that for the rest of us, Dabai asked. Toga gave him a look. Come on, Dabai, Slice and I are the only ones who don't raise suspicion. All I have to do to blend in is tuck my hair into a jacket and act timid, and Toga can look like anyone. Still, Slice handed Dabai a new coat. The rest of you stand out, shall we say. I don't, Mr. Compress protested, and I could have used my quirk on everyone else to sneak them inside. Slice raised an eyebrow. Let me put it bluntly, the ladies wanted some time to freshen up. Chimera sighed. Yeah, okay, we get it. But where's twice? Ooh, I know that one. Toga raised her hand. He told me he was going to check in with Jiren and Kirajiri, see if anything is happening that we should know about. They got a few nods from the rest of the league. Jiren was their main contact with the rest of Japan's criminal underworld, and responsible for getting whatever supplies they needed. At first, payment had been an issue. But after word spread that Shigaraki had manipulated the eight precepts into destroying themselves in a battle with the heroes, plenty of smaller organizations were willing to kick up a portion of their profits as protection. All Shigaraki had to do was send out a few clones, courtesy of twice, to draw off anyone who might threaten his underlings' operations. After that, the money flowed like water. Yubegawara Jin, better known as Twice, cautiously opened the door to Jiren's latest refuge. He changed locations often, so that the heroes couldn't figure out his patterns. It was annoying for his customers, but they'd rather have a minor inconvenience than lose out on the best underworld broker in Japan. To Twice, Jiren was more than just a broker. He was the one who had taken him in when he had been at his lowest. He had also been the one to introduce him to the League, which had resulted in his psychological recovery. As far as Twice was concerned, Jiren was his closest friend outside of the League, and he owed the man everything. So when he found Jiren tied to a chair, bloody and broken, Twice had two thoughts at the same time. The first was the fear that he had lost the man to whom he owed so much. The second was the rage that came with knowing that whoever was responsible was going to die. Jiren, twice managed four steps, and then the focus of his anger stepped out of the shadows. Don't move, Bubegawara, the man said. He was wearing expensive clothes, and a long coat draped over his shoulders like a cape. His forehead was marred by several large scars, but otherwise, he was quite handsome. Do anything I disapprove of, and your friend won't survive. Not too long ago, twice would have needed his mask to keep himself together in a situation like this. Thankfully for him, he no longer needed it to know who he was and at that moment, he was an angry villain. You're gonna tell me why you did this, twice snarled. And then, I'm gonna rip you apart. That's the only thing that's gonna happen. The man spread his hands wide. 
By all means, come at me. But do you want to risk the broker's life? You're powerful, and I promise that I am as well. If we were to battle here, the collateral damage would be immense. Twice his eyes darted between Juran and the stranger. He knew how fast he could make clones of himself. He could flood the entire building in seconds. However, he didn't know the stranger's quirk or his goals, and he couldn't risk Juran's life. He needed to play for time until he found an opening. Okay, no fighting right now, twice said carefully. Why don't you tell me who you are and what you want? The man smiled. You can call me Amplivolt. As for what I want well, I needed the broker as he is in order to ensure that we can have a peaceful meeting. Oh, and I needed one other thing. Twice barely noticed the glint in the shadow before a tranquilizer dart hit him in the neck. Before he could even think to make a clone, he was on the floor. Amplivolt knelt in front of him and grinned. I needed you distracted. What about Kirajiri? Nine asked, out of all of them. He had been the calmest during Shigaraki's trial against Gigantamasia, and had been keeping them in line. He's lying low, Slice said. Apparently, Juran heard rumors that the heroes had a way to track his warp gates, so until we get confirmation, he has to use his quirk sparingly. Spinner kicked a loose stone. You know, I get the plan to have Makia on our side. He's as strong as they come, but do we have a plan for afterward? I didn't sign up with the League just to occasionally annoy the heroes. Gigantamasia is a part of that larger plan, Nine said. Shigaraki hasn't told me all the details, but I do know that he plans to turn society on its head. That requires power and the dismantling of the current system. Sounds good to me, Toga said cheerfully. I just want to live in a world where I can do what I want, and if Shigaraki gives that to me, then I'll cut up anyone he asks. Chimera was about to agree but an unfamiliar noise made his ears twitch. Speaking of sounds, something is coming. The other villains tensed even nine charged up beams of energy on his fingertips. Rather than a human intruder, it was a small drone, barely bigger than a small dog. It wasn't a military drone, and none of them could see any weapons. The only thing that was suspicious was the small package dangling from underneath the machine. Before anyone tried to attack the drone, it detached its cargo and quickly zipped away. Should we go after it? Slice asked. It's already gone, Nine said, and looked down at the package. Spinner, wake up Shigaraki. Whatever this is about probably has something to do with him. Spinner sighed. He won't even get his three hours of sleep. A few minutes later, Shigaraki was following Spinner up to their camp. He was an absolute mess, his clothes were ragged and filthy, and he looked like he was a few minutes away from death. However, his gaze was sharp, and it was clear that his willpower far outweighed his exhaustion. Open it, he rasped, pointing to the package. With a flick of her hair, Slice tore open the box, revealing a cell phone. As soon as Shigaraki picked it up, it started to ring. Who is this? Despite not having a good night's sleep in weeks, Shigaraki managed to keep his voice even. Good morning, Shigaraki Tamura. The voice on the other end of the line was cultured and confident. How was your latest bout with Gigantamasia? Well, I'm not dead, so I'd say I'm still in the game. Shigaraki gestured to the others to remain ready, just in case. And you haven't answered my question. Ah, my apologies. You may call me Yatsubashi Rikia, or Redistro, if you prefer. The latter is more appropriate for matters such as these. Shigaraki had never finished school, but he had access to common knowledge. Redistro. What? You some kind of distro fanboy? Something like that, Yatsubashi said with a chuckle. As for the reason for my call, I'm afraid that I must insist on a meeting. You're gonna have to wait. I'm busy right now. Yes, I expected that response, which is why I procured incentive, shall we say. Your associates, Bubegawara and Juran, are both in my possession. I am aware of how important they are to your organization, so let me be frank. If you do not agree to this meeting, I will kill them both in three hours. You have until then to come to Deka City. Why? Pardon? Why are you doing all this? As far as I know, I've never done anything to you, and you just attacked us without provocation. What gives? Whom I suppose you deserve an explanation. You know of Destro and his attempted revolution. Well, we are his successors, the Meta Liberation Army. Our goal is nothing less than the free and equal use of meta abilities across the world, where the strength of one's meta ability dictates their place in society. You still haven't told me what that has to do with the League of Villains. Patience, young man, I'm getting to that. You see, our revolution has been slowly building in the shadows and would have stepped into the light to become a prominent political party in just a few years. However, your appearance on the stage has thrown our plans into flux. You've managed to gain quite a bit of popularity and garnered the approval of people we've wanted on our side for some time. To be frank, you are becoming a rival party. So that is why I invite you to Deka. One way or another, this rivalry must end. 
Yatsubashi had him by the throat, and they both knew it, twice was too valuable to lose. Shigaraki was tempted to destroy the phone, but checked his reflex at the last second. Where in Deka? He asked. Literally anywhere, Yatsubashi said smugly. The entire city is populated by warriors of the MLA. It is the battleground of my choosing, and the rules are simple. You and your warriors against mine. If you reach me in my tower and defeat me, Bubegawara and Jiren are yours to reclaim, as is the future of the Meta Liberation Army. If my warriors defeat you well, you'll all die. Oh, and if you simply choose to do nothing, know that my company has multiple satellites tracking you, and I can have your location sent to every hero in Japan within minutes. Even with your friend, Kirijiri, there is nowhere on this planet that we cannot find you. At that point, Shigaraki's fraying temper snapped, and he disintegrated the phone. Pack up. We're going to Deka. We're rescuing Jin and Jiren, right? Toga asked worriedly. Shigaraki nodded. And we're killing anyone who tries to stop us. 9. Call Kirijiri and get us a warp gate to the doctor. Hang on a second, Shigaraki. Spinner tried to block his path. It's just us against an entire city, right? Without twice his army to back us up, we'll be overwhelmed. Speak for yourself, Chimera muttered. No, Spinner is right. Shigaraki sat down on a rock and thought. We need an edge, something this Meta Liberation Army wouldn't expect. Redistro said that he knew we were fighting Gigantamesha Ha. As far as he knows, we're still enemies. Toga blinked. But aren't we? Which means that he would never expect him to be on our side. Shigaraki smiled. I have an idea. Makia can smell where I am, no matter the distance. He's sleeping now, but he's been eager to fight for weeks. If he doesn't see me immediately, he'll track me down and destroy anything in his way. Nine's eyes widened. If you are in Deka, he'll go right there and fight his way through the Meta Liberation Army to reach you. And if they're serious about a revolution, they'll probably be somewhat competent fighters, Dabai continued. Which means that a few thousand quirks hitting him all at once might slow him down. And that'll give me the opportunity to finally beat him and force him into line, Shigaraki finished. We get our monster and defeat our rival, all in one fell swoop. Quite an audacious plan, Compress said. Do you think Redistro knows that Makia sleeps for three hours, or did he just give an arbitrary number? I think he knows about Makia's schedule, but he's also got some kind of honor, Shigaraki said. He's known our location for a while, so he could have attacked us at any time, or just called the heroes on us. We'll take advantage of that, Kirijiri will take us to the doctor, and we'll rest until just before the time limit. After that, we'll attack Deka, and get back twice in Jiren. Most of the League was just happy that they would be cutting loose against an enemy that wasn't unstoppable. Nine nodded in approval of Shigaraki's plan, and Spinner just looked relieved that Shigaraki had a plan. Make the call, Nine, Shigaraki ordered. We have work to do. You made a huge mistake, twice said around a mouthful of blood. Shigaraki isn't someone you walk away from after you pick a fight. Yatsubashi chuckled. Your boss is used to killing street scum and petty criminals. He has no experience fighting someone like me. Now it was twice his turn to laugh, though he had to spit out more blood first. What? A guy who likes to hide behind an army of minions before getting his hands dirty. Shigaraki used to be you. Then he's suffering a drop in intelligence. Yatsubashi adjusted his cufflinks. A true commander commands. Shigaraki does that, but he's also not afraid to lead from the front. Twice grinned. You're not a commander, you're just a coward. Yatsubashi slowly walked behind the bound twice and reached down. You have no idea who I am. Bubegawara san I am usually quite personable. Even the people whose fates I hold in my hands would find me quite charming. However, when I am angered I can become quite cruel. Twice felt a crushing pressure on his hands. Then he began to scream. You look well, Kirijiri, Slice said as they stepped through the portal. Enjoying your little vacation in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. It is not unpleasant, Kirijiri replied. Though I do admit that I miss my bar. It was quite fulfilling. And I miss the wonderful martinis you made, Compress said. Truly artful, my friend. Speaking of friends, Toga cut in. What are we gonna do about Jin and Jiren? It's simple, Shigaraki said as he sank into a chair. We go to Deka, and we kill anyone who gets in our way. Then, once Gigantamesha wakes up, we watch as he slaughters everyone between us and him. And when he's tired, we finish our game. We win, and everyone else loses. Toga grimaced, but as she played with the knife in her hands, the thought of so much bloodletting calmed her down. Good, Nine hesitated, but when he saw that Shigaraki was already asleep, he stepped in. We'll split up into teams of two. Some of us won't be able to fight at our best if we all group up. We don't know what kind of quirks we'll be up against, so that's the best we can do. I'll stick with Shigaraki, Spinner volunteered. I'm almost as fast as him, and I'm plenty rested. 
Nine nodded. Everyone else, divide as you see fit. Slice patted Toga's head. I'll go with you, sweetie. Between the two of us, we'll cut up anyone who gets between us and Jin. Toga hugged her. Aw, thanks. I love you. Not so much that you'll cut me up, right? I'm too mad at those meta jerks to think about that right now. Compress swept off his hat and bowed to Nine. I don't suppose you'll mind if I tag along with you. Do what you wish, just don't get in my way, Nine said. Dabai glanced at Chimera. Bet I roast more of these guys. Chimera smirked. You're on. Might as well stick with you, so you can't lie about your score. It's wonderful to see you all getting along. The league collectively spun as Dr. Garaki walked into the room. However, I really do need to check up on Tamura. He's had a rough few weeks. The rest of the league filed out of the room to find a place to rest until the attack. As soon as they were gone, Shigaraki's eyes snapped open. You don't care about the attack, he accused. The only reason you'd be here is because it's ready. Partially, Garaki admitted, and held out four syringes. Your body can only hold one more quirk. If you want the others, you'll need to go through quite the procedure. Which of these would you like? Shigaraki glanced at the names on each syringe. One name in particular got his attention, and he tapped one finger against it. That one. Garaki smiled behind his mustache. Good choice. However, it may take some time for a foreign quirk to bond with your system. You may not be able to use it in the coming battle. Even if it doesn't, I won't waste any more time. Shigaraki grabbed the syringe and plunged it into his arm. Make sure nobody knows about this yet. I don't want anyone getting any bright ideas. Garaki nodded. As you wish your majesty. At just over 2 hours and 30 minutes after the MLA had contacted the league, Shigaraki led his followers out of a portal. Just on the outskirts of Deka City. Calling it a city was a bit misleading. By modern standards, it was more of a large town. The unnerving part wasn't that it was apparently entirely made up of enemies, but how quiet it all was. If Chimera hadn't picked up the smell of humans, they would have thought that the city was deserted. Hello, honored guests. The League readied themselves for a fight, but it was unnecessary. The man sliding, literally, like his feet were unaffected by inertia towards them was obviously a hero. He was a tall, heavily muscled man wearing a form-fitting, purple costume, with a green cape and gloves. Even Nine was thrown off at how welcoming the man's smile was. He looked like he was greeting old friends, not hostile invaders. This guy isn't a top hero, is he? Spinner asked. I feel like I've seen him somewhere. Slid and go, Compress said. I've seen him on more than a few commercials for Detnerat. His performances were always hammy, so I don't think I've ever finished watching any of his ads. I'll take the criticism into consideration for my next performance, Slid and Go said cheerfully. I may be a hero, but I'm still a loyal soldier of the Liberation. Why don't you follow me to the starting point, and I'll tell you what the Grand Commander has in mind. This is weird, Chimera commented, even as the League followed the traitorous hero. Why don't we just kill this guy and get on with it? Because twice is too important to the League, Shigaraki said. The enemy leader knows this, so he gets to write the rules of this game. Besides, it won't matter in the end. It was obvious that Slid and Go could hear them, but he didn't react. Perhaps he thought they were insane, and, to be fair, many of them were, so he didn't think their confidence meant anything. However, he also didn't seem to have anything on his person to relay their conversation. Maybe the entire MLA was just that overconfident. If so, Shigaraki would make them pay for their arrogance. Slid and Go stopped at the edge of town. This is where I take my leave. Dabai scoffed. What? You're not gonna try fighting us with your friends. My role in the revolution is that of eyes and ears within the heroes' ranks, Slid and Go told them. Only a few heroes have joined our ranks, but I am the most important. Whatever you say, Chimera said dismissively. You mentioned that you'd tell us the rules of your little game. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Slid and Go pointed at the tower in the distance. That tower is where the Grand Commander is keeping your comrades. There are over a hundred thousand warriors of the Liberation Army in this city. In order to reach the tower and defeat the Grand Commander, you must get past our army. It's as simple as that, no tricks, no lies. If you really believe that, then you must be lower on the totem pole than you think, Shigaraki said. Your boss is a rich guildmaster who thinks he's a fancy strategist. I'll eat my shoe if he doesn't have a wrench to throw into our plans. That's your opinion, and you're entitled to it. Slid and go bowed, and then slid away. Enjoy the festivities. Seconds after he was gone, crowds began to pour out of houses and businesses. In just a few moments, there were easily hundreds of people blocking their path. Some carried weapons, while others were brazenly using their quirks, and all of them were coming at them with the intent to kill. Stick with your partners, and get to the tower, Shigaraki ordered. Don't stop for anything. 
We need that army between us and Makia. Shigaraki sprang forward and instantly disintegrated the first person he touched. Spinner was right behind him, slashing furiously at anyone who managed to slip by Shigaraki. You heard him, Nine said, even as he skewered a dozen Liberation soldiers with his finger beams. Don't get bogged down. Fine, whatever, Dabai sighed, his arms alight with blue flame. But I'm still gonna have some fun today. Gautsubashi raised an eyebrow as he watched the battle from the observation deck of his tower. Already, the League had pushed past the first battalion sent against them, but they weren't slaughtering them wholesale. If anything, they were just trying to get through as quickly as possible. Interesting, he said. From your analysis of their psychological profiles, skeptic, I would have thought they would be doing damage and needless slaughter. Instead, they seem more mission-oriented. Skeptic, a pale, thin man with long black hair that covered his eyes, looked up from his laptop. If you recall, Redistro, I mentioned in my reports that that information was out of date, and Shigaraki's dominant personality could have forged them into a greater weapon. Gatsubashi nodded. He knew better than to accuse his lieutenant of being wrong, if only because it would derail the conversation. Still, I must say I'm surprised it happened so quickly. It seems Bubegawara's belief in his bonds with his friends wasn't unfounded. That bond is a weakness to exploit, Skeptic said, already sending orders to other officers. All we have to do is take down one or two of them, and they'll fold. You are certainly correct there. Yatsubashi's eyes darkened. Loyalty to a person is ridiculous. Only ideals deserve true loyalty. Toga cackled as she sliced a woman's throat open. She wasn't very pretty, and Toga hadn't had time to get to know her latest victim, so she didn't bother taking some of her blood. At least the corpse was prettier while dripping all that red. Good cut, Slice praised. It was a little high, though. If it hadn't gone deep enough, she would have lived. Lower and deeper, got it. Toga twirled another knife and hurled it through the eye of a man who was trying to sneak up on Slice. Is it just me, or do these guys kinda suck? Slice butchered another group before answering. I'm sure they've been training for their revolution, but they're civilians with jobs, so they probably don't have as much time to practice. That's true, another woman's voice said, and the League members spun around. A woman with dark eyes and blue skin was standing in front of another large group. She wore expensive clothing, and she looked like she spent more time lounging with the rich and powerful than anything else. Our warriors may not have as much experience in fighting, but they make up for it in numbers and devotion to the cause. Slice's eyes narrowed. You look familiar. Do I know you from somewhere? The woman smiled. Well, I have been told that I'm quite striking. No, wait, I do know you. Slice smirked. You were that tabloid journalist who spread those rumors about that politician's daughter a few years ago. Kazuki Chitos. Please, call me by my liberation name. Curious. Still, the comment about her past made her eyes tighten. And I stopped rumor mongering a long time ago. I'm a legitimate reporter now. Speaking of which, you two are among those in the league I want to interview the most. Care to make a statement? Not really, Slice said. I've got a gesture, though. Oh, please, there's no need to be so combative, Hasaki Karuka. Curious smile widened when Slice flinched at the use of her real name. Shall I start with you? The woman who butchered her fiancé when she found out he was cheating on her, but only after spending eight months holed up in your home, unwilling to face the world. How sad. Slice's hair lashed out wildly, carving up a part of the street. You shut your goddamn mouth. You have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, but I do, Curious said. I spoke to his family, and they admitted to his indiscretions, but they weren't surprised that you killed him. After all, he complained to them many times that you weren't stable, that you needed help, and that he was looking to break things off. Slice screamed, and her hair stabbed forward, aiming for Curious face. One of the Liberation soldiers dived in front of the blow, and was impaled through the chest. Rather than go limp or look horrified, he grinned and then abruptly exploded. Slice's hair withdrew, but the ends were shorter and smoldering. By meta-ability, Curious explained. It's called landmine. I can turn anything I touch into a pressure-activated bomb, even a living person. Quite the useful counter to your power, Hasaki-chan. It won't stop me from ripping you apart, Slice promised. Curious just smiled and glanced to the side. And don't think I haven't forgotten about you, Toga-chan. The girl who stabbed a classmate in the middle of a hallway and drank his blood in front of her friends. Oh, I have copies of the picture of your face when you did it, the glee, the ecstasy. I read every quote from your friends and family, how they all called you a monster and a freak, but I have to know how do you feel about what you've done, what's going on in your head. Unlike Slice's blind rage, Toga's face had gone eerily blank, so much so that some of the Liberation soldiers took a nervous step back. 
You wanna know? Toga very deliberately drew a knife and aimed it at Curious. What I'm thinking about right now is how much prettier you'll look after I skin you alive. The two villains split up, Toga went left, and Slice went right. Toga nimbly twirled around a liberation soldier, though she left another knife buried in his heart. Slice's hair might have been singed, but she was still more than capable of slaughtering a dozen men in as many seconds. However, just as she stepped onto the corpse of her latest kill, it detonated, and she was sent tumbling back. Slice, Toga cried out. I'm fine, Slice said, even as she fell to one knee. Just got that bitch. Toga took a step forward, only for Curious to toss out a few pebbles. Toga stepped on one, and it exploded. The blast sent her flying onto several more of the landmines, and when the smoke of their detonations cleared, Toga was bruised and bloodied. Slice tried to go to her aid, but the remaining Liberation soldiers with Curious rushed her, and she was forced to desperately fight them off. Oh, don't go dying just yet, Curious said, crouching by Toga. I still have to know everything going on inside that head of yours. If you tell me everything, I'll be sure to give you a wonderful obituary. Toga cracked open one eye. With so much blood on her face, it was impossible to tell if the other eye was bruised or outright destroyed. With trembling fingers, she withdrew a vial of blood from her bag. Miraculously, the sturdy material of her bag had kept the plastic vials intact. I do. What I want, she gasped out. All I've ever wanted was to be free to be me. I want to cut the people I love and then be them. How interesting, Curious said, even as she backed up warily. What a twisted goal. No wonder you don't fit in with normal society. Normal. Toga tipped the vial back and drank the blood inside. Why would I ever want to be normal? Toga's quirk took effect, and a moment later, she looked like a Suitsuyu. She still wore the same bloody clothes, but her own bleeding had stopped. The pressure of her disguise on her own skin was acting like a bandage, hoping to use the frog girl's form to escape. Curious asked, Too bad you can't actually use the powers of the people you copy. The smile on Asui's face was sick and twisted, and had no business being there. Are you sure about that? From the moment Toga had transformed, she knew something was different about her quirk. She could feel it in her bones, her blood, even if she didn't know what it was. All she knew was that her quirk wanted her to do something, and she was going to do it. Ribbit. Toga opened her mouth, and Asui's tongue extended out like a bullwhip, cracking across Curious' face with enough force to tear off her ear. Curious barely had time to scream before Toga jumped with the proportional strength of a frog, leaping over the handful of Liberation soldiers that tried to stop her. She landed behind Curious and pulled out another knife. Injured as she was, she couldn't completely maintain her transformation, and the left half melted away to her true form. Curious whirled, and saw half of Asui's face and half of Toga's grinning madly up at her. I am, me. Curious had enough time to consider that a profound headline, and then Toga tore her throat out. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 17. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on finfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.